All right, we started recording, so we're like, we're easy and ready right now. Um, Hot and ready, let's do it. I think this is, I prepped this and I should know this, but I think this is episode 62. So that's cool. We're, we're approaching uh, 69. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask, should we postpone this for seven more episodes? Uh, you know, if I had a diligent schedule and kept up on it, I would say yes. But everyone, everyone wants that episode, so just got to fight for coming back on. If I slide <laughs> you a crisp $5 on the Cash App, could you just make it episode number 69? We can just skip seven episodes? I mean, we can just joke about it anyway, and they're all 69 until we're past it. I'm down with that, as long as I'm 69 number one. All right. I think you might be 69 number two. Oh, damn it. Uh, I'll just take 62. Basically, ever since we hit 60, everyone wants to be like, oh, 69. Yeah. Fun fact, I was hoping to end the tour on 69 jams, and it almost looks like it could happen that way. Nice. Just putting that out there. All right, so... (laughs) Um, Tim Hankins, how are yes, you? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm all right, with all things considered. Yeah. In the van? Uh, In the van? It's a bus. All right, bus, even better. We had a van, we upgraded. Never right. forget. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, St. Louis, born and raised... No, or sir. No. I, was, I was born in Waco, Texas, actually. Okay. Um, But I moved around, like, a lot as a kid with my parents. Uh, So, I mean, honestly, I think most times I didn't stay in any given city for more than a year as a kid, you know, until my later years. Uh, But I moved to St. Louis with my mom when I was, I want to say, 12 or 13, right around that age frame and uh yeah kind of been posted up there ever since until i hit the road (laughs) all right and then um as far as ever what people may know you they'll either know you as tim hankins bmx they'll know you as tim's pre-owned or they'll know you as capital bmx so probably any of those or the jam guy you could be the jam guy yeah Guy with all the gems. Don't forget, X up ride guy. That's X up ride guy. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we're kind of like cutting into this a little bit awkward, but that's okay. I'm a little bit awkward right now because I feel like I'm out of practice on doing these, but we'll uh we'll smooth out here. So yeah, I'm awkward. I'm right, cool. I'm gonna pop up. And hide you for just a second. Uh, we got a oh, man. Okay, we got to do the damn tour Instagram post up, and it's hiding it partially because I've got my screen messed up to show you properly. All right. Anyway, canceled. So we're gonna do this a little bit out of order, but. Uh, we talked about this, so posted this on April Fool's Day that the rest of the tour is canceled. So there's a long-winded message here. I think we're just going to read right through it, and then we can stop and address things as they make sense. So uh, do you want to read it, or do you want me to read it? You'd probably prefer me so that you can uh, a- talk to things. Yeah, I would say it. I'm doing this on my phone, so I don't know if I can okay. pull it up. All right, I got it. Um, <laughs> I can technically share my screen to you as well, but that may make things more complicated and hard to navigate. So, yeah. all right, your post is, well, I guess all good things must come to an end, and the Do the Damn Tour is no exception. So that right there is where people start saying, is this an April Fool's Day joke? Um, Which... Don't answer that. I really wanted to keep the Capital BMX brand tour alive just long enough to make it through all 50 states. 
but as of today I'm just happy that we were able to do 34 states without incident. Unfortunately, there are just too many sour apples in the BMX community working towards canceling me and my tour for reasons that have no truth to them whatsoever. A bunch of rumors that can be easily disproved with facts, receipts, video, photo proof, you name it. It has now reached a point where a certain local St. Louis rider has gone out of his way to call up all of the tour sponsors to tell them BS lies to get Capital BMX brand cut off from having prizes to give away at these jams. Never mind the fact that the rumors this person is spreading couldn't be furthest from the truth. And to top it off, I have been receiving countless threats against my home, the bus, my business, the bus, and even threats against my life by local riders in the Midwest if I ever come to ride bikes in quote-unquote their cities. At the end of the day, BMX is supposed to be fun, and the past few weeks of my life haven't been entirely spent chasing my own tail, or have been entirely spent chasing my own tail and trying to prove to people that have never met me that I'm not the boogeyman. For all these reasons going on behind the scenes, it's easy to say that the fun has been completely sucked out of what I love doing with my life. And without fun, there's not much reason at all to carry on the way I live. And so it's time to move on, grow up, get a job, whatever may ha whatever life may have in store for me this next year. Lastly, I just want to say thank you to everyone amongst the 52 plus BMX communities that we've reached with the tour. All of the best memories of my life were spent with total strangers at the time. Now made lifelong friends on any given Saturday in the streets of any given city. I would not trade the past three years of my life for the world, and I am so honored to have shared these years with so many rad people. Thank you forever, BMX. Please be kinder to the next nobody that steps up to do cool things for you. So, where do you want to start and break that down, Tim? I'm going to switch oh. back to you, and then do you want, you want to go line by line? How do you want to touch this? Well, I guess I'll wing it. Um, oh. I'd like to saying that i mean everything i wrote is a hundred percent you know factual it's stuff i have been dealing with none of that is an april fool's joke none of it was made up for attention or anything like that that uh that really has been the past few weeks of my life uh, dealing with a bunch of very unnecessary drama um and hate and retaliation against the tour and people Unfortunately, actually working towards trying to cancel me for stuff that quite simply never happened. <laughs> but uh, I, I will say the one thing that I hope to be an April Fool's joke out of that uh, is that I'm still in the headspace. I'm still 100% ready to take on the rest of the tour. Uh, I don't want to give it up. However, the very real situation that I'm facing at the moment is that I literally have like maybe three weeks left to organize the last series of the tour in order to get it on the road and time to actually knock out these last 16 states before winter time sets in and I get stuck up there in a blizzard in the Northeast in a bus that doesn't have heat or AC or none of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, and, and, and from where I'm looking at it, I, I really can't. I can't justify spending another year of my life into the tour. Like it's really close to being over and I'm willing to finish it this year. If I can pull together enough cool heads to make it happen, you know? Yeah. But something's got to change fast. <laughs> it, I'll be honest. It usually takes me, you know, more like two or three months to line up a series of jams like this. And I have been trying to get in touch with people to make things happen for a few months now. It just, it's been kind of a bunch of dead ends on account of all the drama I've been dealing with and rumors going around about me. So, uh, a, a lot would have to change so, in the next few in order for the tour to actually continue is pretty much what I'm getting at. Uh, I want it to be an April fool's joke, but it's, it's a pretty it's, real one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that pretty much brings us to why we're having this conversation. We're starting this uh, podcast episode with really just, you know, address 
address it straight on and see where we can go with with any conversation anything like that and try to clear the air um drama free yes sir that's that's where my head's at i'm with you because <laughs> it's not going to do anyone any good your side their side whatever to be throwing names around and putting people on blast people know who they are people listening either know who it is or they don't and if they don't they don't need to pretty irrelevant yeah. if there's one thing i want anybody that's listening to this that hasn't met me to take from this it's to you know have your own experience with somebody before listening to some jumbled up bullshit on the internet that's been thrown around by multiple people and there's no truth to it whatsoever you know just, you know uh, at least in my case like send me a dm uh, i'll give you my phone number we can talk on the phone like I'm an open book. Uh, if there's something that needs talked about, uh, there's no need for it to go on behind the scenes. Y- y'all can call me. We can talk to it. I'm a human too, you know? <laughs> right, right. A uh, couple interesting points in here. You've done 34 states, but you've done, what, 52 jams? For the tour, yeah. Um, that's not including our local St. Louis jam, so it's around 60 street jams total now. Okay, so with the St. Louis Jam, uh, are, have you counted one of those as uh, Missouri, and that's checked off the list, or is like the final stop Missouri? Um, so I did put it on the tour flyer one year, just so people would you know see it being promoted along with the tour, but I didn't actually count it like. As far as jams and like highlights videos, I didn't count it as a number or whatever, you know. Um, but we did do a jam in Kansas City with okay. the OPB, other homies out there uh, that went off. So Kansas City, Missouri threw down for the state of Missouri. That was awesome to see. Sweet. So you've got that one. Um... And then uh, as far as the last jam of the tour, uh, in a perfect world where the tour actually continues and I'm able to finish it this year, I'm trying to pretty much wiggle my way around the, you know, the Northeast. And then I want to bring it down and end the tour exactly where it started originally in Richmond, Virginia. That's where I want the grand finale to be. That'll be state number 50. Technically I already hosted a jam in Virginia. So, but, uh, it wasn't a part of the tour. It was before the tour. So uh, it'll officially be 50 states with the tour as soon as cool. I make it through. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah. Please help me. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening, please help. <laughs> um, I mean, rumors, we'll talk about rumors. Uh, people going out of their way. Yeah, we don't really need to talk about that. I guess... Calling sponsors and telling them lies. Um, you know, you're you mentioned right after that that these things can be disproven. So, you know, sure. how without necessarily having to do it right on here and call you out for every little accusation that's ever been brought up and you know, proven pictures, receipts, and stuff like. The, I think the big, big one that people are saying is that you're you're taking sponsored jam prizes and you're selling those, and that's how you're paying to move, make this tour happen. Yeah, uh, there's no truth to that statement whatsoever. Um, it really bummed me out. Uh, and initially when it came up, there was a dude even messaging me about it. And kind of same thing I said a few minutes ago. I, I messaged the guy. I invited him to call me on my phone number. and. You know, we could talk about it. And I asked him many times to send me proof about what he was saying about me. Um, and the, the, he sent me screenshots, but what he sent me screenshots of was a conversation with who knows who, you know, it's got the name chopped out of it and everything. And, and whoever that person is that they were messaging said that they caught me selling jam prizes and 
I don't know who that person is. I don't know if they even know who I am. I don't know if they have me mixed up with somebody else. Uh, it was odd to me. The dude did mention that so-and-so, whoever he was talking about, had to cut off my account with whatever company he was talking about that he wouldn't disclose. Uh, they had to close my account over this. Um, that stood out to me because up until last year when I opened an account with the building, uh, I've never had an account with anybody. <laughs> yeah, right. So that stood out to me as something that just didn't make any sense at all. I don't. I genuinely don't know if they have me mixed up with somebody else. You know, uh, they said something about my bullshit bike shop in a garage which was peculiar to me because I've never owned a house or a garage. <laughs> I've never had a bike shop in a garage. Uh, I do own this bus that I live in full time and I do have the bike shop in the back of it, but the the bull, the bullshit bike shop in the bus, that's all me. Uh, yeah. So but again, uh, are you selling new parts? I mean, other than the capital brand parts, which we'll, we'll talk about, but like, are you selling new parts or are you selling primarily or all used parts? So primarily used parts, yes. Uh, but it's mostly anything I can get my hands on while I'm in any given city. So I'll hit up Marketplace. I'll find like a custom built BMX bike, like a really nice one. Like we would ride, you know, all mm -hmm. after market. If I can get a decent deal on that, you know, they want to get rid of it, then I can break it down part by part and sell the used parts for a little bit of a profit. That helps me, you know, put diesel in the bus and keep the torch chugging along. Uh, I will go to bike shops. Uh, sometimes they'll have like old stock stuff that they're willing to let go of for cheap maybe, or like limited edition stuff is something that I'll keep an eye out for. Uh, I'll pay full price for it. If I know it goes for more money on the internet kind of thing, you know? So uh, I kind of look for inventory where I can get it. Sometimes new stuff does come along, but uh, never once in my life have I taken prizes <laughs> out of a prize box and put them for sale in our shop, you know? So mm -hmm. it, it was really disheartening to hear those rumors going around. It was disheartening to hear that somebody took the time out of their life to call the sponsors of the tour and try to get me cut off yeah. uh, on, of that, which, you know, it can't be proven. And, as far as I'm concerned, it can be disproven because everything I sell is logged through my Wix inventory on my website. So, you know, everything has its own SKU number. Everything's logged into inventory. Every time something sells, that never goes away in my orders. My orders go all the way back to 2018 or whenever I started Tim's pre-owned, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it really, and then even for that matter, the social media, I post everything that i put up for sale straight to the social media the moment it goes up for sale and i haven't deleted anything off of there ever so if you scroll through tim's pre-owned bmx on instagram if you use the wayback machine to look up all my product listings ever if somebody wants to sit on my phone and go through all my orders <laughs> from 2018 and please show me where i sold a jam prize then that would be awesome you know <laughs> yep. but nobody's showing me proof that i've done this i know for a fact that i've never done it if you watch the jam highlights videos everything gets given away if a company was genuinely concerned about me not giving away the prizes they've sent me they could take a screenshot of every single prize table and run an inventory of their products on the table you know it's at the end of every jam video i have every single prize laid out on a table I call our five winners up one by one to pick out their prizes. So they get first pick out of the bunch. And then right after I take everything off the table and do a product toss with it all. And it's all documented. It's all in the videos, you know, mm -hmm. it, I don't know. It, it, and it doesn't make sense to me to begin with why I would risk my career when, when, you know, my livelihood is literally hosting jams and giving out these prizes from these companies that, doesn't make sense why I would risk it all over like a ten dollar pair of pedals or something, you know? Right, right. It, it's just a lame accusation. There, there's no truth to it, and it's it's sad that people are resorting to lying about me to try to keep me from coming to their to their town to do something for their scene, you know? I, yeah. Well, and let's talk about it a little more because it does happen, though. I mean, I'm sure you've been in scenes where 
Like, it's happening. People, whether it's selling or people are getting stuff and they're just like, oh, man, that's a real cool hat. Like, no one will miss that. Yeah. It happens. And, and, I'll be and on- other times, stuff shows up and jams don't happen. And where did those prizes go? They just dissolve right. into the scene. And I'll be honest, I'm I'm not a perfect person or anything. I'll own up to my mistakes if they're mistakes, you know. But like the Capital Lou Jam every year, the St. Louis Jam, we get way, way more prizes than we get for like the tour jams, you know. Yeah. Uh, and most years I'll grab like a double X shirt and a pair of socks out of the prize rack for myself to wear throughout the year, you know. Yeah. But I've done it. I, I do it probably every year. I don't take bike parts. I'm so picky about what I ride. You know, uh, the, a lot of the jam prizes aren't aren't for me. Yeah, uh, and I, and uh, never uh, for the kids. You know, but I've never taken anything. You know, not a shirt, not a bike part, nothing, and turned around and sold it. You know, yeah. not something that sponsored to me to give away for free. It's never happened. Yeah. Well, and I feel like. I mean, you've done this for enough time. You know when you get a prize package from Shadow or a prize package from Kink or something like that, you more or less know what items are coming in that because they're kind of pre-kidding them. Like, it's the same package, not necessarily year over year because they have, like, the New New Year's stuff and then it's last year's stuff is in the Jam Giveaway stuff. Yeah, the Color Witch but it's still the same pair of pedals and the same pair of grips, you know, yeah. year by year, year long. Like, uh, and I'll tell you this from experience, having done 52 jams over the course of three years, you know, uh, they send me the same stuff every time. And that's more to my point of, please, somebody that is spreading these rumors about me, go show me the product listings for those items because i know those companies know what they sent me they send me the same stuff every week (laughs) and and that's that's where i'm going with that too is like i've hosted enough jams to know that when you get a package they know what they sent you 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 know what's out there if you saw someone you know if you're in a town and someone's trying to sell you something you know enough to go Dude, did you pay for this or did you win this? Right. So even from that side of stuff, like, and and on that note, you also know even if they did pay for it, you can't buy it because it's eh, shady. And all the time I get this at the tour jams because, you know, I do have the mobile shop and it's full of bike parts. On everything, they're bike parts that I pay for with my mm-hmm. hard-earned money you know, to keep that shop stocked up. It's not jam prizes, but kids know that I got the bike shop and things are for sale, you know. And then I'll have the prize table at the end of the jam in front of the mobile shop with all the prizes laid out. And a lot of times kids will come up, how much for the pedals, this and that. And every time I tell them the same thing when that happens, I'm like, wait five minutes. Let me get set up. All this shit's about to be free. Like, just hold on. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Everything is for sale, but... All the prizes sent to me by sponsors on the table right here, it's all about to be free, buddy. Just, you know, sit still, let the winners pick their prizes, and then fight to the death in the product toss for whatever you want. <laughs> yep. So, uh, it, it breaks my heart that people would think I would do that. It, yeah. It couldn't be from the truth. Yep. No, I mean, it It really doesn't make sense. Because like you said, it would be... You would be attacking your own livelihood, your own, you know, giant jam series you've worked so hard just to get and make happen, too. Yeah. So, I don't know if we need to really talk too much about that one. What about, see, all right, this one is such a funny one to me because other people paying for the jam. So, oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, A, you're saying not what? true, but B, what difference would it make? Why would it matter one bit 
if it was your money or someone else's money making this happen, if the jam is happening, it's doing cool things for the scenes, and yeah. and you're still getting it done. Yeah. I mean, uh, tech technically, so all sad. the companies are paying to make it happen by sending sponsors and stuff too. But absolutely, you know, it's it's like I don't know. It's a weird accusation to as if it's trying to make you less or something, which doesn't make a difference. Yeah, I mean it. It seems to be a pattern with some people that definitely, like you say, that they, they just want to make me to be less than I am. And uh, again, I'm an open book. I'll be very upfront and saying that I'm not doing great. (laughs) Uh, I just spent my last $13 today on Chick-fil-A right, right before this. Uh, (laughs) I think down to whatever changes in my, uh, in my cup holder here. Um, But you know, I'll be fine. Uh, I got plenty of bike parts to sell. Something will sell, you know, well, when it's ready to, yeah. I guess. But yeah, it's sad to me that I lived the life that I lived by choice, so that I can make the tour financially possible, so I can make these jams financially possible. And there's still people out there, and even people that I used to consider to be close to me that want to completely discredit me by saying somebody else is paying for me to do this there's no way tim's doing that by himself mentality you know you know last year it was a friend of mine Uh, everybody wanted to talk about how a friend of mine pays for me to travel the country and it but when i finally caught wind of it after it went through the grapevine like what (laughs) what are you guys talking about you know like that dude Mm -hmm. has maybe drinks before he's never put diesel in my tank He's never paid for the bus repairs when they happen, you know, like, like why, why are y'all telling people that when it's not true? Like, and maybe I shouldn't take it so personal, but when this is literally my livelihood and I put like 80 plus hours a week into making sure this tour can work and to making sure this dumb garage bus bike shop can work, you know, like, uh, oh, goodbye shopping cart. Oh, right into the truck. No. Ouch. I just Rough. watched Mocha truck. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> that was bad. It was cruising too. That was terrible. Uh, yeah, dude, it it does break my heart though to hear people always want to discredit me and put the hard work on other people. And I, I'm not asking them to give me credit or ride my nuts either, you know. But like mm-hmm. lying about me to people and stop lying about me on the internet and stop discrediting me to people that have never met me, you know, like, again, I'm a super firm believer and have your own experience with somebody, you know, like, and and I just wish people would treat me that same way, you know, just meet me. You might not like me and that's fine, you know, but at least meet me before believing what some other people on the internet that have never met me have to say about me, you know? And don't like you for legitimate reasons. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, honestly, there's a lot of good reasons to not like me. Uh, (laughs) When people bring up those good reasons, I'll agree with them, you know? But it's hard for me to sit by when people are saying whatever they want about me and the general population is just assuming it's true. Like, there's no truth to the statements at all. Like, like that's what gets me. And I, I I try not to buy into the negativity as much as I can. But when it is constantly riding my coattail, that negativity, like, at some point I have to address it. And now I'm learning when I try to address things on my own platforms, whether it be trying to vlog a video of myself talking about these matters or responding to Instagram comments and DMs one by one, you know, explaining the real situation. It just, it does not portray the real me, you know, it, it, it doesn't come across right through the internet like that. You know, the the written word is not friendly. No. and, And I think honestly, like that's probably one of my biggest problems in life. Uh, and I'll own up to that all day long. It's that me and internet me 
I, at least from my, my opinion, my perspective, maybe me and internet me are not really the same person, you know? And, and one thing I've grown to realize that really bothers me and I struggle to do anything about it is that a lot of the time when I'm on the internet and I'm on social media, I'm using it as a tool to scrape money together to keep this tour moving so I can keep doing these cool things in person with people, you know, whether it be with my team riders or with the riders that I'm working with in these cities that I'm doing this jam with, you know, it, money's got to come from somewhere and social media has been my biggest tool for getting money to come in. The jams don't make me money. You know, it, it's very rare that I make more than like a hundred bucks off of a jam, you know? There have been some good ones where I got real lucky and the scenes were super supportive and all that. And I love that, but it's very rare that the jams or anything make me money. So I'm on Instagram and Facebook posting for sale listings, you know, talking about bike parts, you know, trying to find stuff to buy and flip and sell. And I'm learning now that that's all people see of me. And maybe that leads them to believe that I'm some greedy asshole that doesn't really love this shit. You know, I'm just here for the money, but... You just hustle and use bike parts. Yeah, but I feel like anybody that really knows me and has spent time with me knows that, like, I am not that greedy person, dude. Anytime I've came up on a little chunk of change, I put it right back into BMX. Well, like, uh, BMX... I send that my team riders on projects and to get bike parts on their bikes, you know? And, like, but, like, never am I doing super well. Yeah. <laughs> like, BMX and skateboarding have crafted this weird like anti consumer, anti you know, profitability mindset after yeah. like the late eighties stuff where it was all giant corporations. It's just it's not cool if your brand or your company makes money. Which is yeah. ridiculous. That's... Like there's there's you could go over the line if you were just like absolutely bending kids over the barrel for, you know, charging them $60 for a pair of grips because where else are you going to get a pair right now? That kind of stuff. Like, no, you're not, no one's doing that. And you're not going to do that. But if that's what you were seeing, then yeah, like, okay, maybe it's wrong. But to, pay 10 bucks for a pair of grips hold it in your inventory drive it around displace other inventory and sell it for 15 dollars like the people that don't own businesses or operate businesses in any capacity or or even it's operate like be beyond just a general worker to see what the cost of inventory is and the cost of maintaining overhead and what what it actually takes because it's not that you paid for it it's that you have to pay for it and make enough money to pay yourself enough to eat chick-fil-a in a walmart parking lot every once in a while <laughs> yeah and like, and, and that's... pay your bills like all this little stuff comes up and you have to also make enough to cover the next part, too, because it should self-sustain. And that also facilitates giving cool stuff away and and hooking a kid up that can't afford a set of pedals. Like, got you. Yeah, and I'm all for that. I mean, you know, as much as I sell stuff, I also try to work with the people that I'm there with in person. So when I'm on tour and I'm with, you know, different people every week in a new city. I, I'm trying to help them out the best that I can. Some of these places do have bike shops and these guys just don't need that much from me. And that's fun. You know, other places there's kids with, you know, ratted out bikes and no local bike shop with BMX parts. And I try to help them out the best I can, whether it be giving them jam prizes, which are given to me to give out for free or, whether I got an old burnt up pair or whatever in the back of the bus that they can get some life mm -hmm. out of for, for or, you know, I'm, I'm always cash is king as well, you know, uh, come with some cash and I'll give you a great deal on whatever you need, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you don't have to pay credit card fees and all that 
nonsense. Exactly. Of course. When I'm in town with people, I, I try to be as helpful as I can, you know, and, and I do have to sell a lot of things, you know, I, I can't give everything away for free by any means, but I try to do what I can, you know, mm -hmm. any means possible. Yeah, no, I, th I think people probably do see your internet pers personality because a lot of the time that you see posts from you, it's on the defensive, especially on your Facebook page. Where yeah. you're like, once a, I actually I haven't seen any lately, so maybe it's died down a little bit, but there was a period um, of time a year or two years ago where at least once a week someone was accusing you of not sending them the money for a part that they shipped to you or that, you know, you, you short paid them because the frame was scratched up and they only sent you pictures of the other side and you're like, <laughs> you know, trying to justify or defend your responses or anything. It's just like, you're constantly on the defensive. Yeah. And I've been trying to be way better about that. Uh, that's been a problem for me since before I was into BMX, you know, uh, and I just want to be honest in saying that I, I don't, uh, I live a pretty BMX only lifestyle. I don't really have much in the way of like people to talk to about things when mm -hmm. things come up, you know, uh, and I've been terrible about it over the years, just taking my problems and posting them to Facebook or whatever. And then I also struggle with my own pride. I'm, I take, and again, I think maybe this doesn't show on my internet persona as much, but I take a lot of pride in what I do. You know, I, uh, even when it comes to selling used bike parts, like I clean everything up and inspect it really well before I sell it, you know, and I, mm -hmm. I stuff from people. I ask for very specific photos. I, I ask if there was damage on something or not, you know, and, and sometimes I've blown up when, you know, uh, things didn't meet my expectations, I guess, or when I didn't meet people's expectations and instead of coming to me about it and letting me handle it as the seller, they take to the internet to write nasty things about me. And uh, I, I hate that if I do make a mistake that people want it to reflect on my morals without giving me the chance to make it right like mm -hmm. and, and i want anybody to know and i know this is stated somewhere on my website but if you receive something and there's something wrong with it that i did not catch because i am human and i might make that mistake it it has happened before it might happen again just hit me up you are entitled to all of your money back you know and if for some reason the part is actually totally thrashed and not usable i don't even want it back like you can keep it and have your money back you know like yeah it's i'm not i'm not trying to bend nobody over and spank them over bike parts like uh, i'm trying my best to make an honest living running the shop i run and, and eventually i do have goals and aspirations for it being more than just a pre-owned bike shop and a bus but uh, unfortunately the tour has come first the past few years <laughs> Right, but like once the once the tour wraps, whether it's premature or you 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 know get to finish it out, like it'll be a lot easier when you can sit down in a location and start building a proper business. Not that sounds wrong, but no, no, I'm like, with you. Cause you're, you. yeah, but it, it, it's proper in the sense of, you know, all the tax filings, however you've got it listed, uh, you know, keeping track of inventory, all of that. It's all, it's a proper business. It's an internet business that you can also sell live. But I, I also would like to have a brick and mortar that is not my stem and sprocket. <laughs> right. You know, uh, and that's what I want, you know, uh, and it's, it's something I don't talk about much, but it's been on the to-do list for a long time. Uh, I do have a 10 year business plan that somehow I'm barely meeting somehow <laughs> every time I check, I'm like, okay, well, we're not too far off, you know? So, uh, and part of that is to get a brick and mortar store, ideally a warehouse, but you know, we'll, 
we'll see where things are at once the tour is actually over, see what's doable. If I got to run a little storefront, that's what I'll do. You know, I'd like to start actually spending money with all these brands that have been supporting the tour throughout the years. I'd like to stock brand new bike parts. Uh, I do plan on keeping uh, the pre-owned thing going probably indefinitely as well. Uh, I think it'll definitely kind of hit the sidelines a little bit when I do get a brick and mortar and I start putting money and time and effort and, you know, working with brand new products. But I do really like the idea of, and I think some of my internet haters have said this about me on the internet and, and I agree with them a hundred percent, but uh, I really like the idea of being the GameStop of BMX, you know, if you, if you want to come in and upgrade your bike and your old parts are still good, I'll give you a little bit of, you know, store credit or cash for them and, mm-hmm. you know, and that helps the shop grow, you know? So that's what I would like to do uh, in time after the tour. Uh, obviously I can't, afford to do anything in st louis when i'm trying to be on the road full time but again whether it be now or at the end of 2024 i will be done with the tour and i'm hoping to get to cracking on those kinds of goals you know keeping it local st louis a little bit more really focusing on my hometown scene and you know just keeping the love alive yeah it's awesome uh i really like the GameStop of bmx though i like that yeah a lot analogy. Of told me cares in like a derogatory way like but they'd leave me a bad review or something be like man fuck this guy he only offered me da 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 he's pretty much the game stop of bmx i'm like yeah dude I... <laughs> Just, well okay I mean, but let's talk about it, that though because game business has to buy something and sell it for a profit that's just business that's well, not even just game you know but well, right and and the thing is you've got a market of people looking for used bike parts so yeah you know let's say you're gonna offer someone 15 bucks and you're gonna sell it at 30 or you know whatever that's a, just an example but you're gonna offer okay. someone 15 you're gonna sell it for 30 you have a collection of people that are willing to pay 30 dollars what does that person have? True. Ma- and a lot of maybe the- they could make 20 off of it. Maybe. Or they could yeah. sell it right now. So it's up to my, them. Our, my biggest market is the custom complete bikes, like I was telling you, you know, mm-hmm. like a really nice bike. Because no matter what, and I know people don't like to admit this, but used bikes don't hold value whatsoever, you know? And especially... Uh, like completely custom built, you know, let's just say a $2,000 bike when it was brand new to build, you know, the chances of somebody wanting that exact bike and wanting to pay even a thousand dollars for it is really out there. You know, like there's not many bikes at all other than like really collectible ones, obviously, but like your general, aftermarket really nice bike that you can still build brand new for 2000 i mean they're going in in between 500 and like maybe 800 you know and that's that's if you're lucky like two or three hundred if you're if you're really just trying to sell a complete bike and you're looking to move it two three hundred bucks exactly and then i can and you know that person obviously does not want to list every part of the bike on ebay and go to the post office multiple days a week to ship out different bike parts you know they're just trying to get rid of the bike and you know yeah whether whether they realize it or not they're not going to get big money for it so if i can get it for whatever their asking price is or close to it and i know that i can take it apart and i can take the time to list it on the internet piece by piece and run to the post office three days a week to ship out the bike parts off of it, then I can make a little bit of money that way, you know? So uh, usually, you know, when I'm doing that, it's, it works out for everybody, you know? Uh, I try not to lowball people too much. You know, I have a pretty good idea of what these things buy and sell for because I've bought lots of them over the years, you know? Yeah. Well, and and, Uh, I mean, parts are easier because... 
you know, like, here's the range that new parts sell for. So, like, obviously, you've got to make some money and be less than new parts. And so I got to pay here. Like, that's pretty easy. The complete bike, when people are like, well, man, how could it be only, like, 10% of what I paid for it? And you're like, because nobody wants the stuff you have on it. <laughs> Yeah, it, they they want that pair or they want that frame, and they'll they'll yeah. pay you three hundred bucks for the frame, but you're you don't want to sell all the parts, so you're gonna give them all the parts for with it too. Yeah, and just generally speaking, but like, oh, where was I going with that brain fart? I feel like we're a little bit in the weeds, but I it's also relevant in the way like. People don't understand business. Yeah. Because it's so, like, profit averse. That's really yeah. how we got here. Yeah, and and one thing I want people to understand is that I'm I'm not profiting the way people think I am. I mean, I I'll share with you right now. This is where I've been living for, you know, four years. Here, hang uh, on. Let me let me hide myself so that people don't have to look at me. <laughs> there you go. I mean. This is my bed. Uh, there's camera equipment stuff all over. There's a storage locker back there. My t-shirt's hanging up. That's it. I don't have, like, air conditioning or heat. Uh, that's my refrigerator right there, that cooler. Uh, yeah, well, actually, that's my whole kitchen, I guess we could say. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not living great off of selling used bike parts is my only point. And... And again, I'm fine with that. I'm not complaining about it because it makes what I love doing possible. And that's the most important part. Can but we swivel the to... camera back closer to your window just for for podcast sake? That's good. Okay. I can get it to stick. Oh, there we go. That's decent. Oh. <laughs> I'm like way off to my side too because I'm like overlaid on you right now. I know you can't see how this looks. But like yeah. you can you can see my room. My room is not in this shot. <laughs> oh, I got <gotcha. laughs> But yeah. It, it blows my mind that there is people out there that think I'm like profiting off of BMX. Uh again, I think I said it earlier, but like you're getting I, by. And I just spent it on Chick-fil-A and again, money will come in. I'll sell more bike parts. That's not really a concern but like i'm i'm broke pretty frequently <laughs> like yeah. i'm i'm scraping by i'm not i know i post a lot about stuff that i want to sell that i'm making a profit off of but that entire profit goes back into the business and back into doing cool shit for bmx you know i I'm not living that great off of BMX. I promise everybody that much. <laughs> I mean, going back to the rumors, I if anyone really wants to pay to fill up Tim's uh, fuel tank and <laughs> give me a shout, <laughs> uh, you know, hook, uh, hook him if, up with some hot meals and <laughs> if I had all this money that people are talking about and I came from all this crazy generational wealth or whatever people want to make up about me, like. The first thing I would buy is heat and AC for this bus. That would be fucking fantastic, you know? A television, maybe? Oh, I didn't even show you my power source. It's the cigarette lighter right here. That's all I have. I don't I don't have solar. I don't have extra batteries to run shit off of. I'm literally raw-dogging it in this bus because every time I save up money for nice things, the bus can, like, smell it, and it's like... Bleh, 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 bleh. And then it eats all my money. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. If anybody wants to pay for me to have nice things, you know, you're welcome to. But uh, it, it hasn't happened yet, and I'm not banking on it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, that's that's like my – I think that might be my favorite realization about that rumor is like, actually, no, if someone wants to do that, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Uh, I'm, I'm totally open to financial sponsors. If anybody's listening that – wants to help finish the tour, you know. Uh I plan on retiring after doing all 50 states, but if anybody wants to pay for me to travel the country again, I'm totally down. I'll do it for your brand or whatever, you know, but uh 
the this tour is all on me and uh it's stressful and heartbreaking and it costs a lot of money that i'm surprised comes from somewhere <laughs> you know that and somehow bike parts sell just enough for me to keep chugging along and uh i'm super grateful for that you know but uh, it's not any deeper than just that <laughs> right so let's see i guess before we backtrack into like the kind of just more casual conversation this current round of drama where is this coming from? Is it you? You posted a picture or a flyer or something looking for, or with a whole bunch of jam dates and cities on it, right? And with the caption or with a comment on there, you know, if anyone wants to help me make these a reality, this is what I would like to see happen. Something along those lines. And you've got you know, a couple people that pop out of the woodwork from different scenes, basically stay off my lawn. Yeah. So unfortunately it does go back a little bit further than that. And I don't want to go too much into detail. And I specifically, I don't want to talk about any names or nothing. Cause as far as all this drama goes, dude, I, the shit's for the birds. Uh, I don't, I don't want the drama to go on any further than this. Whether this drama ends my fucking tour or not, like I, I would like to still be able to ride bikes in my hometown and be able to travel and ride bikes with my friends in other states. And I, you know, I, I don't want to see the drama through. I don't want it to go any further. I don't want people to think that I'm this person that's living for the drama because really, it tears me apart and I'm over it. But it goes back to a post that a local rider back home made. Um, and of course there's people listening that are going to know who I'm talking about and I'm trying to be as unbiased as I can when talking about this. So please don't fucking rip me apart just well, for mention. I, I don't and, but, know if, I don't know if I said this on the podcast or right before, but if people know who it is, they know who it is. Good for them. If you don't know, you don't need to period. It doesn't matter. I'm just, it's not relevant. If you, you don't need to make drama out of this because it, it's not worth it and I'm not uh, I, I'm trying to put an end to this drama I don't want beef with any of you guys if you're listening but genuinely but uh, yes a local writer back home made a post uh, he was writing a street spot that initially I thought I had never seen before well uh, I have never seen this particular spot before I never noticed it whatever guess it's been right under my nose the whole time anyways but He's riding this spot, and there's a dude, uh, property manager, or security, something. I'm I'm not terribly sure, but pointing a gun, you know, a loaded gun at this rider. And uh, originally, I heard about all the drama that came of it, because supposedly that man, uh, you know, blamed his, you know, quick actions with his gun on a street jam that had came to the building before and he talked about how you know the, these bmx riders come once a year and they leave a bunch of trash behind and trash the property and it's a big problem you know and with that in mind that that's a huge problem i agree with that 110 percent. you know uh, mm -hmm. i don't want anybody to doubt where my head is at on that matter um some drama went about there was a pro team in town when it happened and I guess they all talked a bunch of crap and somehow it made it through the world of the DMs to one of my friends where they're talking about you, you got to watch out, you know, with Tim and, you know, consider your friends more wisely because all these people hate him and we're talking shit about him and his jams and how he ruined street riding for everybody and this and that all because of that incident. Uh, and, and that was all behind the scenes, just drama that, came through the grapevine but nonetheless when i heard about it it broke my heart a little bit to think about that um uh, especially if the dude actually said word for word that you know we come by once a year and leave a bunch of trash uh that is not what i wanted to hear at all so uh and i do 
hope people can forgive me and understand that the day of the Capital Lou Jams, which is like the most busiest day of my life every year, I am running around like a fucking chicken with my head cut off. You know, I'm hosting the jam. I'm filming the jam, trying to make sure everything happens on time, trying to make sure we get back and do the award ceremonies before people have to go home. You know, I'm I'm everywhere. I'm mm-hmm. all over the place. And something like trash being left behind at spots, unfortunately, it fell under my radar for probably a number of years. You know, uh, if it was happening, it's not something that I was noticing, you know, mm-hmm. um, after we heard about that, you know, that that was not too long before a Capital Lou Jam. Uh, we did try our best to implement measures of preventing that from happening anymore. Now that's been brought to our attention. Uh, we did what we called the Human of the Day Award, which was, you know, not a biker, not not a rider, not not any specific anything, just whoever out there was putting in work to make sure that everybody was good and all the spots were left the way that we found them, you know, and and that seemed to work out pretty good for that one year. Uh, I was really proud of that. And again, I am bummed that it took, you know, somebody else experiencing something negative and the city that I've been riding as long as I've been riding uh, to, to bring light to that situation. But I am glad that we're able to be better about it now. Um, now moving forward that the photo ended up getting posted way more recently, you know, uh, I want to say easily more than a year after all that came about. Um, the photo got posted on Instagram and this person did not call me out by name, but he did say something along the lines of this happened because of somebody and we all know who kind of thing, you know, uh, and he was talking about me and somebody else who is an industry person decided to chime in and fill the blank. And that started a bunch of drama that uh, got really out of hand. Um, uh, I tried to combat it with kindness the best that I can. And it's kind of like I said earlier, I've been trying to be better about my defensiveness when it comes to serious matters and BMX on the internet. Like I, I'm much more leaning to the side of just kill people with kindness now. So that's how I was trying to handle it. But at the same time, I had my team riders uh, and some of my close friends jumping on the post to defend me. And it got so out of hand. I mean, to, to the point of threats on both sides. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not proud of the people on my side that did that. It's not an honest representation of how I feel or how I want to operate my business within BMX. Um, It it got to the point of people making fun of my best friend's baby mom and stuff. And it, it it just got so blown out of hand for no reason. Uh, Well, I guess there is a reason I get it. You know, I, I get the sentiment, you know, but, uh, and some of those people are in the areas that I was having problems in with all this new drama. Um, so moving forward on to kind of what you were saying, uh, I made a post a few weeks ago. It was not my first post trying to get things going in the Northeast area, but Unfortunately, it was the first post of mine about it that actually gained any traction and not in the right way. Um, so I made a post with, I believe, the tour flyer, you know, map of all the states that I've already done. And then another list of individual cities or states that I wanted to do jams in. And then I, I honest to God, I, I forgot to cut off the dates from it that's something that i would normally do i wouldn't normally put dates on a post trying to line up jams you know those were my target dates those are the dates that i would be shooting for if i was going to make the tour happen before the end of the year you know but obviously it it would be up to locals to inform me what works best at that point you know it it could be the week before the week after a couple weeks off and i could still make do you know yeah um I think a lot of people got stuck on that. They got stuck on the list of cities with dates and 
they just viewed it as, yo, who is this guy that we've never heard of before just saying that he's going to host a jam in our city? You know, like, show, he, showing up with a date already picked. Yeah. Uh, like, and, and I understand that. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with their point of view on that. Like, I understand if they took it that way. Now that all this has came about, I very clearly see how the post could read that way. However, I do want to bring to light the fact that if you read the caption, like what I actually typed on the post, I was very clear that, and again, I'm paraphrasing. I don't have the post right in front of me to read it, but I, I got well, a good is, idea. Is that, was that on Instagram? Yes, it, it would have been is on it, the Capitol. Is it still live? Because uh, I'm only seeing one. I'm scrolling a little bit. I don't see the one with the dates. I see one from March 14th, which is a countrywide tour of BMX Street Jams. Uh, shows the map with most of the Northeast grayed out. Series seven lists a whole bunch of locations, but there's no dates on this one. They're not, I think there's a second slide to that post. Maybe. Yep, there you go. Yeah, a bunch of qu- yeah, but everyone has a giant red question mark next to it too. Like. Yeah, and so from my perspective on that, you're right. Okay, I- so I'm going to show this quick. <laughs> That's it. That. Almost right. my whole is ran off of like iPhone notes, you know. So. Bless my heart, but uh, that was a screenshot of a note, and how I do it, I lay out the list of cities that I want to accomplish for any given series of the tour, and my uh, just being up front, this is how I've done 52 jams in 34 states, everything that I'm about to tell you right now, and I've not experienced anything even remotely similar to the backlash I've experienced this time, but I'll make that list. And for the cities that I have homies in that are going to help me, and I know we're good to go no matter what, I put a green check next to the city. That means we're locked in. We're good to go. And then I do the red question marks next to all the ones that I still need to find locals for, you know, make plans, actually make moves to make these jams a reality. Um, And then, you know, as I lock in details with the locals in each city, I go down the list and I check them off in my notes. And that's how I get everything started, you know. And again, uh, I tried to make it very clear in the wording on the post. Uh, Again, paraphrasing, but something along the lines of, hey, guys, I'm trying to come up to the Northeast to wrap up our tour of street jams in all 50 states. You know, I'm looking for riders in the following cities or states to help me make jams happen or help me make good things happen for your scene. Something along those lines. I I can read it if you want. I got it up. Please, Please send it. All right. Here. We're, we're back. Um, <laughs> proud to be celebrating 75% of the way finished with the Do the Damn Tour. I'm so incredibly close to accomplishing my goal of hosting free-to-ride BMX jams in all 50 states, and I'd like to finally finish this goal before the end of 2024. I'm now looking for help in all of the cities or states mentioned above. The sooner I can lock in some small details with local shredders in any of these areas, the sooner we can get flyers and official dates posted online. Just shoot me a DM if you're in any of these states and want to help make fun times happen in your area. It's time to do the damn thing in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Alaska, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire. There you go. When you put it that way, Andrew, uh, I think my point was pretty clear. But again, I I completely understand how anybody that didn't read too far into the caption of the post probably seen the the picture with the cities and the dates, and they probably jumped the gun and didn't like it. And I understand that, and and I want to make it clear I'm deeply sorry to anybody that took that the wrong way. Uh, anybody that thinks that I would come to town without any local guidance whatsoever. Uh, again, I've been on the road since January 1st, 2021. I've hosted 52 street jams all over most of America, you know, <laughs> and uh, every time it it's all done through locals. Like uh, I've never posted a flyer for a jam with an official date and locked in details. I've never posted one 
that a the flyer photo didn't come from somebody local that gave me permission to use the photo for the flyer and b without somebody local giving me a recommendation for a meetup spot to advertise on the flyer because realistically i haven't been to a lot of the cities i go to before mm-hmm. i do the jams there. so i i need local guidance it's the only way that the jams can happen uh so it it does hurt a little the think that a bunch of people hate me for trying to do jams in their city without local guidance when the reality is that i was actively looking for local guidance and it just got misunderstood um but uh i still have a little glimmer of hope if there is anybody in the states that andrew just mentioned to get in touch help me lock in a flyer photo (laughs) and meet up address and we can try to finish all 50 states by the end of the year, but I, I'm, I am running out of time. Uh, it, it's a lot closer to not happening than it is to happening, unfortunately. And it, it breaks my fucking heart, but I can't spend another year of my life into the tour. I really can't. It can't run into 2025. Uh, I'll have to move on to other things with my life and with BMX. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it essentially, it's like, putting your life on pause to make this happen because everyone else is growing like their final game plan and you're working out of your bus not starting your brick and mortar shop not working on you know really any i don't know what your uh situation is but be awful hard to maintain a girlfriend or whatever in the in the process of traveling all around the country you're just you're on hold just to make something cool happen for other people. Yeah, so it's not something I talk about a lot, but a, a lot of sacrifices in life have been made to live the life that I live. And I only choose to live this life because it does make the tour possible. You know, so uh, mm-hmm. there's just my life that I really want to see through. And the tour, like you're saying, has a lot of it on hold. And again, I'm okay with that because this tour is my life. I've put my our life into this i've put more money into this than i think anybody could truly fathom you know like i I am so far invested into this tour that i genuinely from the bottom of my heart want to make it happen you know but again i'm living in a bus with no heat and no ac so spring summer and the beginning of fall is the only time span i have to actually knock out this entire series of jams in the northeast yeah and the like my only other option is to wait until next spring to do it but that's a whole extra year of my life put on hold dragging this tour out i mean let's be real people want this tour canceled you know it's only a handful of months away from being finished <laughs> If you just let me do my thing, the tour will be over before you know it, realistically. But, well, no, I get it too. It just but. doesn't, I don't know, doesn't really make a lot of sense. I'm trying to think, like, you're right, though, because I've hosted my fair share of jams, and the reality of a jam, you know this just as well as I do, you can put a date like you could say tomorrow we're having a jam meet here people will show up you can have no prizes and people will have an awesome time that's true or you can put months and months and months of planning and everything into something and people will show up and have an awesome time the jam is what you make it and uh- that's that's something I've told other people as I try to inspire them to to host their own jam is it doesn't have to be over the top. The hardest part is finding a date. And usually you just pick one and you work around it and make it work. Cuz if you try to find the perfect date, you'll never have one. Right. And I, I'm not going to lie in that regard i feel like i've been so blessed with the tour and how many perfect dates have worked out Uh, yep knock on wood but like 
it blows my mind that out of every state I've went to to host a jam, like the only one that had bad weather was Jackson, Mississippi, which I just got redemption on, you know, last weekend, nice. which is awesome. Really good time. Uh, you know, um, the, Somehow with the tour, it's always worked out to where the jams couldn't be on a better day. And one thing I I hope people can learn from this as well is that the Capital Jams, the Capital Tour Jams, the the ones in other cities that aren't my own city, they're usually not very over the top. You know, I pull up uh, to a meetup spot. We kind of hang out behind the bus and wait for everybody to show up. Yeah, you know, I, I do some simple morning announcements. I I film the jam and, and usually it's nothing more than the local scene there. Occasionally you'll get some stragglers from other cities, but a big thing I've noticed, you know, like like if you look at like let's say one of the old monster street jams they did, like everybody from the whole freaking region flocked to those cities. You know, there was a thousand people at those mm-hmm. street jams, you know. Uh, they were very over the top, you know, ours, you know, people see the tour list and just like one good example would be, you know, in Las Vegas, we had a badass jam. The whole local scene, as far as I'm aware, was there a bunch of dudes that, you know, I had a lot of fun with and enjoyed meeting. Nobody from Phoenix came and Phoenix is only a few hours from there, you know, Mm -hmm. because Phoenix had a jam coming two weeks after that, you know, the, they don't got to stress going to the Vegas jam when the capital tour is coming to them, you know? So, and, and that's not to say everybody views it that way. Again, sometimes there will be travelers at these jams, but usually it's just the local scene in that city, like 90%. Like for the most part, it's mostly just the local scene and they're just getting clips on their local street spots for my iPhone. And I make a freaking edit out of it, you know? And mm-hmm that not many of the tour jams have been even remotely close to over the, you know, they're all pretty calm. They're all orchestrated with help from local scenes. I try to make sure that there's a local guy leading the pack to spots, you know, and yep. everybody call me the blower out of street spots. And uh, I get how it's easy to draw that assumption, but yeah, but all right. So here's the deal. Like, as someone that's hosted jams in Pittsburgh and up here in, in Binghamton, you don't, I mean, you're working with the locals. You don't take people to your good street spots on the, the jam. You can't, you take people to the ones that are known that, Oh man, that's so awesome. Well, yeah, everyone freaking knows the spot. Everyone's seen it in videos for the last 15 years. It's not a secret. But right. people are stoked to ride it. Now, you also have to coordinate, like, man, this first spot, we're probably going to be here longer than anyone really wants to ride it because it's the meetup point. Right. So it's got to be roomy. There's got to be some sitting room. Like, the first spot is actually pretty important to pick. And then you try to coordinate, like, a game plan... But, yeah, you're not going to your, like, crusty back alley cool spot because you can't take 50 people there. Right. Like, three people can session that spot. There's no reason to take 50 people there and blow it out. So, it's a ridiculous accusation. Yeah, and there's very few cities that I've gone to where I had to leave the jam myself, you know? Mm Mm-hmm almost always make sure there's a local dude at the head of the pack taking us to street spots. And there's been multiple times where the head honchos in the bike scenes that I was hosting a jam in told me, Hey Tim, everybody's going to want to go to this spot. I'm asking you kindly not to take the jam there because you will get it capped off. And it's that easy. All you got to do is talk to me like I'm a human being. You know, the message is loud and clear. The jam can't go to that spot. You know, that happened in Tampa, a couple spots. I'm not going to drop names or nothing, but somebody very respectable and close to me asked me nicely not to take jams to a spot. So I didn't take the jam to the spot. (laughs) Yeah. 
Right. Now, you can't help what people break off and go do their own thing. Sure. But it's probably not a big deal if 10 people break off and go ride a spot as opposed to 50. Right. And, so, and another... All these jams I do are in, like, a downtown area, you know? Like, mm-hmm. like I'm not going into the cuts of any of these places and taking jams, you know, into the suburbs or anything, into the low-key spots. I'm not taking them to, you know, the schools that nobody knows about out over yonder. Like, it's all the spots that any street rider would find if they went to that spit, went to that city and spent two hours there, you know? Like, almost always, it's the main, central, already blown out spots that are you know, not yeah. going to be a, problem on a Saturday usually and all that fun stuff. And then when it comes to security and stuff, like they ask you to leave, you know, we might ask for five minutes. They'll either say yes or no, you know, yeah. everybody gets last tries in on the way out and we leave, you know, like it, yeah. it's not. We've hard. had one situation that did not go that way. What's that? I said we had one situation that did not go that way in Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah? I think it's a 45-minute video clip that never got published anywhere. Oh, no. That is just hard-pressing the security and then, like, Red Rovering them against a wall so that people could get another run. Like, it was it was a little bit sketch. Yeah. See that? <laughs> and fortunately bad stuff does happen uh i myself have had to learn to keep keep a better hold on the jam if yeah bad well, stuff especially like, when it's not your scene i feel like that's one catch like that was in pittsburgh and at the time my scene so yeah. it's kind of like what do you do you know the the scene wants to press this yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a little different when it's hosted by someone outside the scene. If the scene pushed that and you didn't interject, it's going to be kind of like, well, Tim came here and blew up our spot. Yeah. Um. You know, and I'll say I'm one to speak up if I see people acting out of line at one of our jams. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll be honest with the tour jams. And again, I think just because they're not big out of control jams, they're usually just like some local dudes yeah. that want to keep their street spots around, you know, uh, it hasn't really been too much in the way of problems. Now I will, say a couple of the capital Lou jams have gotten a little out of hand in ways that I wasn't stoked on. Uh, we have been good since then about not doing the same mistakes ever again. Um, again, I think the trash incident was uh, a big one, you know, but there's been other things that uh, I wasn't stoked on either, um, like a car ride one year that went terribly wrong. And uh, well, one year, some <laughs> I say so, some kids, the, the whole jam decided to take down a fence, and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so, uh, I've learned to be harder on people in person about it when they start acting out of line, because that's not the representation I want street riding to have. That's not the representation I want BMX in general to have. You know, uh, I prefer the representation of, uh, as far as a bystander would watch and see, have gone down. Look at all those young men out doing something fun on their bikes, you know? Mm -hmm. But I prefer the work thing that we do to be raking pegs across a ledge or a rail or whatever you know it there shouldn't be there shouldn't be as much tomfoolery going on at the jams yeah no actual destruction of property yeah yeah we, we don't need to total a car no, no border or, borderline assault <laughs> yeah and uh and, and i'm glad like as far as security goes and like the police and stuff like i've never really had an incident of people wanting to act up, you know, like mm-hmm. when the boot comes, keep it moving, you know. And at last year's Capital Lou Jam, uh, we got 
and it was weird because we're riding like this little plaza and like it's just us it's just our crowd you know riding the plaza and i guess it was like somebody that lived down the street you know like like we weren't in their way or anything they just heard the commotion they came out checked it out and they called the cops on us and the cops rolled up and exchanged a few words and then later on in the day i guess somebody called the cops on the jam again and the cops told them to tell us that we have 10 minutes to keep riding the spot and then move on so uh it it seemed like to some extent like Mm -hmm. like the police knew about the jam was going on and and they were kind of communicating to hey just let them do their thing for 10 minutes. They're going to be leaving in a minute. Like no confrontations needed. You know, uh, it's, yeah. it's not the day. It's not that serious what we're doing. We're out having fun on our bikes one day a year, you know, as far as the loo jams go yep. uh, for the other scenes, it's every weekend, but different city every weekend. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. I fr- the one Pittsburgh one we had, um, like i don't know probably a hundred people at this one rail spot and it's right along like a main walkway it's right near the two stadiums football and baseball stadium and there's a couple restaurants there a couple bars there so like people are hanging out buying drinks buying food while we're all like hanging out sessioning there and the the cops roll up and we're like oh awesome right and they're just like were you guys chasing the ducks? You can't be chasing the ducks. <laughs> We're like, well, okay, we shooed a couple away because we didn't want to hit them, but we were not chasing the ducks. And they're like, don't chase the ducks. And then they left. And we're like, freaking weird, man. <laughs> yeah. Again, a down an area, like, you know, and don't get me wrong. I understand not everybody feels the same way, but in a downtown area, I feel like, you know, a small street jam with less than a hundred people is not this huge disturbance on a Saturday. You know, I also like to think when, when someone calls and they're like, there's like a hundred bike riders here that they have to go. No, there's not. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You're on drugs, lady. <laughs> Just relax. <laughs> there are no <never> flips. <laughs> like a hundred bike riders here jumping on my railings. Uh huh. <laughs> Betty, quit calling. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, again, I I understand that street riding, especially, is somewhat of a destructive activity in a lot of ways you know but again downtown area a bunch of spots that have been blown out a million times before everything's been done on them you know that again if there is a spot that there's a worry about being capped like yeah a local need to present that concern you know Mm -hmm. so it can be not but uh other than that like I'm not seeing all the destruction from street jams that I hear through the grapevine, you know, uh, somebody said something about there's all these posts on Instagram about street spots that capital BMX has blown out with their tour. And I, I, I'm not going to completely deny that, but all I'm going to say is I have not seen a single one of those posts. Nobody's tagged me in a single one of those posts. If they're out there, I've never seen one. It's never been brought to my attention, you know. Um, Please do if those posts are out there and somebody's listening and, you know, isn't afraid to talk to me, then please do send me those posts. I would love to see them. Uh, I would love to see the error in my ways so I can address it with myself, you know, but. Yeah, uh, I don't think anyone's goal is to go around and blow out spots. No. And again, my number one goal is to work with the BMX communities in all 50 states. That's the whole plan, you know? So, like, those BMX communities need to quit huddling together in group chats and 
making up stories about me and they need to just message me and help me make something happen and just lay down the rules with me, you know? Hey, you can't take a jam to these spots because you're going to blow them out if you do, you know? Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. I don't know that kind of information when I go to a city I've never been in. And I understand the concern of this guy's never been to our city. He's going to come to a gym. I get it. I've dealt with it in a lot of cities, but like, again, 52 jams later, it's not been a problem. Like people are saying it is, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, I get way more messages, people asking me to come back to their scene to do another jam. Then I get messages telling me to stay away until recently. I've got a lot of messages lately telling me to stay away from Michigan and Ohio. But, like, again, <laughs> all, all the badass riders I've met in 34 states that all want me to come back, dude, like, uh, it, it doesn't add up with what other people are saying about me, is all I'm saying. <laughs> well, and I, I think I said it to you when we first talked of like, almost three weeks ago now but yeah i'm gonna get myself canceled for this one too imagine midwest bmx being salty i know imagine it's a shocker really yeah that's crazy you know i just got done and this video will probably maybe even be done uploading by the time we're done recording this but i just got done with hawaii My white ass flew out to Hawaii where the locals don't really like white people that much. And I did a street jam on their local street spots and they helped me do it. And they all had a great time and they've been messaging me ever since, you know, trying to make plans for when I can come back to Hawaii. Like, like, come on guys. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, these are experiences that I'm having with real people, you know. I, I like, want to ask you your coolest one, but Hawaii has to be kind of the coolest one just because of the how the trip has to go to get there because it's a long flight. It's a lot of prep work. Yeah, so... Different scene. Oh, like, the scenery and everything is totally different. Oh, dude, I loved it out there. It's so beautiful out there. There's so much fun shit to ride. And again, the locals we're just fantastic you know uh, really good people out there in the bmx community uh i will give a quick shout out to vato at the skate park that's what everybody called him i guess that's his real name uh he did not like me uh i'm white and a biker and he took major offense to that but other than that all the bikers did community is fucking awesome out there bro like seriously such a good group of people i can't speak highly enough of the hawaii scene uh hopefully people from this video can head on over to our youtube channel and check out the highlights video it was it was a pretty good one it wasn't a huge jam because you know obviously people couldn't really travel to go to that one so it was just the locals you know a small jam but everybody came out and got down and from my understanding it was the first like bmx get together like that that they've had in a long time it was the first time a lot of those dudes rode bikes. Uh, re- really sick time. Uh, I can't speak highly enough about the Hawaii scene. Seriously. That's Capital BMX brand on YouTube. I just yeah, looked it sir. up. Hell yeah. So yeah, uh, I'm working on getting caught up on videos now, but uh, here within the next couple of weeks, all 52 Jam videos will be up there. Again, number 50 is uploading at the moment. Or Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, that means here in the next few days, I'll have a Tucson, Arizona video coming, and then a Jackson, Mississippi video. And then uh, we're going to be doing the Capital Lee Jam next weekend. There'll be a video for that too. Year number eight. <laughs> nice. Yes, yeah, sir. All right, back to your, your post that uh, caused some, some issues. You've got these cities listed. How bent are you on these cities? Or. You know, you got, like, uh, let's use Cleveland as an example. You got Cleveland on here for Ohio. Mm -hmm. Are you, like, dead set on Cleveland? Or are you, like, no, if Akron, then Akron's cooler. If Columbus, then Columbus is cool. Like, So, as far as any of those cities go, I just want to be clear that, like, none of that information, especially on that post specifically, was set in stone by any means. So 
again, like I stated in the post, I'm looking for help from local shredders to make those jams possible. And if there's a better city for those jams, it, it would take someone speaking up. Now, I will be just transparent on the fact that Ohio has been one of the jams that I've been trying to get going for the longest now. I was in touch with a writer from there that uh, wanted to help me make a jam happen in Columbus. And that seemed all fine and well. I had no problem with that until he started getting threats on my behalf. And he was sending me screenshots from all these writers talking about, oh, y'all better be able to fight then. Uh, people talking about, you know, later on talking about breaking into my bus and stuff and and stealing all of my shop inventory to give it out to their local community and just some pretty crazy threats came out of Columbus. Long story short, uh, I remember a well-known figure in the BMX community did tell the guy that, and, and this is a point that really trips me out, but he told the guy apparently word for word that it's not the fact that you want to do a street jam in Columbus. It's the guy coming to town to do the street jam. We don't want him coming to do it. So a lot of threats and bullshit came out of Columbus. That dude ended up telling me, he said, look, I talked to the Cleveland riders and they're down for capital. You know, the, they're stoked to have the jam happen in Cleveland. I'm like, okay, cool. So, Moving forward for a while, that was all I knew, that Columbus was kind of probably not the move, you know, and I, I don't want to step on toes and piss off all these people any more than they're already pissed off with me, you know, mm -hmm. so that's when I put Cleveland on that list, because as far as I was aware, from the only dude in Ohio that I had heard from, from my previous post, was that Cleveland was the move, they were down to have me, so I put that out there, all right, I'm trying to find somebody to speak with in Cleveland, you know? And uh, that didn't blow over super well at first either, you know? I got a lot of hate for trying to do one in Cleveland, and a lot of people behind the scenes started piping up to put an end to that. And I'm like, okay, well, like, my bad. Like, <laughs> I was just going off of what I was told, but also nothing was set in stone. So, like, instead of blowing all this smoke behind the scenes, just reach out to me, like, Again, that was the whole point of the post. Just reach out. If we need to figure out if Akron's a better idea or if we need to reroute back to Columbus or whatever is actually going to work and piss off the least amount of people, I guess, at this point, then that's what I want to do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, again, none of that's set in stone. Please, if you're listening and you're in those areas, reach out. And I just want to do a jam in Ohio and a jam in Michigan, street jams, because all 52 of my jams so far have been street jams, you know. I'm open to ideas. I don't want to blow out any spots. I don't want to take over your guys' BMX scene. I just want to film the BMX scenes in all 50 states on their local blown out already street spots. That's it. I promise. <laughs> yeah, and have fun while doing it exactly yeah all right well that, i mean that was kind of my my approach was like okay let's address this because you might have people that see this flyer and go oh he only wants to do cleveland so that's what i wanted to say hey look this is just ideas yeah and, and i will be honest cleveland is along the route that i would like to take it's but like I, I'm pretty sure I have to drive through Cleveland no matter what. So Cleveland kind of makes the most sense to me. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm Cleveland local, so I'm not trying to speak for any of those guys by any means. But Cleveland would be ideal, and that's why it's on the list. You know, uh, that plus being told that Cleveland was the move prior to all the drama. Um. So, but yeah, uh, it's up to the locals to tell me what's going to work best. Uh, but again, uh, the tour is kind of a ticking time bomb. So <laughs> if you're listening, speak up, help, help make cool stuff happen or cool stuff is going to go away, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we've beat this horse a little bit on on the drama side of things. Do you want to talk about just uh, 
capital. I know we talked about Tim's pre-owned quite a bit from a business standpoint. Uh, you've mentioned the capital Lou jam. That's separate from the tour. What is your capital Lou jam? So capital Lou jam is essentially my birthday party every year. <laughs> so in 2016, we started the tradition of doing an annual street jam every year. It originally started as a Where's Tim video shoot that we tried to do, and it kind of fell apart because uh, pretty much I made a flyer saying, we're going to film a funny, like, Where's Waldo-themed bike video, and we'd like people to, like, come out and help with it, you know, come be a part of it, you know? And then, like, uh, I, I want to say it was probably, like, 35, 40 people showed up for that. We're like, oh, what the fuck, you know? And that that was early on. I, I want to say that must have been, you know, late 2015 or early 2016. And uh, uh, that's kind of when we realized we were like, oh, like uh, our community actually fucks with what we're doing. And if we post a flyer on the internet, they're going to come support whatever it is. So, uh, and I had already had the idea of doing downtown street rides, but originally I had it in my head that. I could work together with what was known as the Lou crew at the time, which was another St. Louis bike crew of some cool dudes that uh, rode a lot of street and park in the area. And uh, in my head, you know, we had Capital Crew, they had Lou Crew. I wanted to collab with them and do Capital Lou Jam. You know, was always my headspace. Uh, and then they kind of fizzled out and quit doing stuff with the Lou Crew. And, you know, then we did the Where's Waldo thing and realized we can have fun in the streets of downtown St. Louis with our friends. And well, fuck it, let's just run the Capitol Lou Jam anyways, you know, and it'll just be a capital only kind of thing, I guess, you know. And yeah, year number one, we met up in the Taco Bell parking lot in downtown St. Louis, which was a shit show. And some people traveled from out of state and stuff, which was really surprising to us at the time. And uh, yeah, we rode around downtown and just had a bunch of fun that day. You know, I, I'd say Capital Lou One was probably even like the most poor Capital Lou because it was just so loosely thrown together and just like, oh, let's park it. <laughs> see yeah. who all pulls up to the Bell parking lot today. <laughs> uh, and that that was a great one. And then we just. We kept it going throughout the years, you know. Uh, Capital Lou too might have been the biggest one. Uh, we had we had somebody from Puerto Rico come out. Uh, we had Matt Perkins from Florida. We had a bunch of badass riders in town from all over the place. A bunch of the nowhere BMX dudes even came out to ride street with us. It was fucking awesome, you know. And then from that point on, that they just kept getting better and better. You know, uh, the weather's kind of affected it some years in terms of like size and stuff. But every year for my birthday, we get together in the streets of St. Louis and throw it out and film it and put it on the internet and give out way too many prizes for one jam, probably, <laughs> which is fucking awesome to me because <laughs> I feel like BMX Santa pretty much. <laughs> yep, it's uh, it's awesome. Jam prizes are so crazy when you have a lot. Like, we, when we've done ours, we do the Pittsburgh and the New York historically. So it's only been two, but we take, we get a lot of sponsors so that we don't have to ask for double prize packages. And then we just kind of split it between the two. So we end up with probably twice as many sponsors as we need, or three times as many sponsors as we need. And yeah. then you just like, what are we going to do with all this stuff? <laughs> so, and not to beat the same old dead horse, but it does somewhat prove a point, unfortunately. But at last year's Capital Lou Jam, because we did get a thunderstorm midday, which scared off a lot of people that would have came out. Still had a badass jam, though. What happened mm -hmm. last year was nothing shy of magical how it all came together. But at the end of the day, like, there wasn't, that many people around for the product toss and i mean i'm telling you we have thousands of dollars in product to give away from mm -hmm. like 25 different companies you know yeah and, and like all my homies were telling me like yo tim we should probably like bag half of this up and save it for next year i'm like the fuck are you talking about bro that, 
they sent me this shit to give away. Like, they'll send us more shit next year. Like, yeah, we're about to rain on these fools. <laughs> right, and they hung out. They stuck around. Yeah. So like, your approach to that is a little bit different than mine has been. Man, fuck it. They can have it all, dude. <laughs> it ain't mine. <laughs> yeah. Now, your approach is a little different than mine has been. We always try to, like, get rid of it slowly throughout the day and like we'll we'll ride back to the car fill a backpack or two and like if someone does something cool like right on the spot hit them with something yeah. so it's like trying to push it and then it's like hey i've got you know whatever a sprocket here for whoever does this gap first and like just kind of call stuff out in the wild that way but it makes a huge pain in the butt to haul it all around all day long. Yeah. I was going to say, we did that with the first and the second Capital Lou Jam. Maybe the third one, too, I want to say. But it's just lugging around a bunch of stuff all day long. And then one thing I notice is, like, you see kids riding around with handfuls of prizes all day long and, like, yeah. setting them down, losing them. And it's like, okay, you know what? And I still think it's a good idea because people will definitely throw down for like a nice bike part, you know, on a spot. Like, yeah, but you can also like, just put 20 bucks up. Get the sprocket and somebody's going to try it just on account of getting that sprocket, you know. But uh, I don't know. I kind of like the way we have been doing it where we do all the prizes at the end of the day and we just make it fucking rain on everybody that stuck around, you know. I, I like that approach, too, and that's what I'm wondering, like, because we've always done it that way, but then you also, if you've only got a small bag of stuff, you kind of operate under a scarcity mentality, where you don't want to give away, like, the last three things you've got, for two yeah. reasons. One, you don't know how much you have left, and the other is that you don't really want to make the ride back to the car again, because you're going to miss the jam. Right. Yeah, and then you end up with everything left at the end anyway. Yeah. So uh, another thing we have been doing in recent years, though, to kind of fill the gap and not giving out prizes all day long is, well, we've been doing, like, a lot of raffles and stuff and just using all the proceeds from the raffles to give out to the riders throughout the day. So I'll give my best friend just a stack of cash from raffle sales, and it'll be, oh, 20 bucks, somebody send that shit, you know, like, mm -hmm. right cash money you know yeah so yeah. uh cool way save all the physical prizes for the end of the day and give out cash throughout the day seems like a a cool thing too <laughs> yep I, uh, I agree fun fact for you um <laughs> and maybe there's some haters out there they're gonna think less of me for this but i'm so proud of it i think it's fucking hilarious <laughs> but uh I got Hoffman bikes on board for one of the Capital Lou Jams. And Matt Hoffman sent me uh, one of the, uh, it was new at the time. I think they had just came out with them. One of the like army green Morgan Wade frames, you know, like a, a nice aftermarket frame, you know? And, uh, and this was when we were doing like the, the after ceremonies prize format, you know? So I, I'm setting up all the prize tables at the end of the jam, you know? And, with the capital Lou jams and that amount of prizes, we'll like, we'll have this table. Like, okay, you get one thing from that table, two things from that table and three things from that table, you know, kind of based off of value or how mm -hmm. cool they are whatever the case, you know, um, I'm holding the Hoffman frame in my hands. I'm like, where the fuck do I put this? You know, there's going to be the first thing anybody grabs, you know, like, but it's not even fair to put it on the prize table. I'm like, fuck it. It's going in the product. <laughs> no, that's the best so, way to do something like that. Dude, or... an after Hoffman frame and the product talk. Dude, that, that's one of my crowning achievements in life. <laughs> what we, we like to do one with our, you know, we can throw a peg as hard as you want and it doesn't matter. It's fine. So <laughs> with our, with our pegs, we like to do like, all right, here's a pair. But, Anyone that wants the pegs, get in a line. And then we'll just, like, walk off with the one. And then it's just a race for it. Full-on scramble. So, like, throw it, and then whoever brings it back. 
Whatever <laughs> it takes. Whoever brings that back gets the pair. So we had a good one in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, it was actually before the jam, and I want to say it was like only a dance comp T-shirt or something. It was like not a high stakes prize by any means, but uh, the meetup spot was like. I don't think it was a DIY spot, but it was like just like this little skate plaza thing. It didn't have much, like some rollers and flat ledges, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was on the other side of a fence, you know. So I yelled out to the jam on the megaphone. I'm like, first one to the other side of the fence gets this dance comp t-shirt. <laughs> when I tell you, like, at least five grown-ass men fucking like climbed up that fence like spider monkeys and then plunge themselves to flat ground into the skate park on the other side just to touch down first <laughs> for a teacher. <laughs> There's a video of it on YouTube. I encourage anybody to look it up That's and watch funny. it. Cause it's funny. <laughs> and I'm talking, it was like a 10 foot tall fence, like chain link fence. It was awesome. <laughs> Uh, quick shout out to anybody that's listening that wants to host jams. It's a really good time. You can make a lot of people stoked. You can convince a lot of people to climb fences or hit handrails, whatever. Yeah. Do all the stuff them. you wish you saw. Yeah. Yeah. You can, <laughs> you can make your friends at the jams do all the things that you wish you could do. You know, it's awesome. <laughs> host more jams. Hit up sponsors, get prizes together, do something sick for your community. Seriously. Then I won't have to. <laughs> but let me finish my tour first. But first, let me finish. <laughs> well, and it, so it's interesting, too, that you start getting this stuff shut down and people attacking it more and more as BMX is like slowing down. From a, yeah. an industry standpoint, it just hasn't been as good as it's been in the past. And I don't know if it's like you see more and more small brands pop up here and there all the time, which just dilutes the the whole pool of potential buyers. If it's, you know, just the cost of living is outpacing people's raises and you know they're just holding back and running that part for another you know year before they upgrade the frame or if it's an after effect of 2020 where it was the best bmx year probably ever as far as sales and everything go like completes just moved companies couldn't keep them in stock and then after that Then after that, they reordered for 2021 as if that was going to continue. And like, no, everyone just got their bike. Like, there's a long window now where people aren't going to need stuff. Yeah. And then you... It's uh, it's weird times, for sure. Um, I'm learning very early on that I picked a terrible time to try to start a parts company first of all, you know, and, uh, kind of like you're saying, maybe during COVID, like would have been a good time to start a parts company. Uh, no, (laughs) maybe not. Shit probably would have sold better then is all I mean by that. But at the same time, uh, I've always considered it a blessing now that I am kind of throwing myself into the mix with everything that's going on in the industry, because I'm, I'm learning fast. I'm learning early on that the industry will shit the bed and fail you, you know? So, uh, uh, I feel like that's teaching me kind of better what to expect moving forward with my parts brand that, Mm -hmm. that I do not plan on, uh, stopping with anytime soon. Even if the tour stops, I I do not plan on ending capital. Uh, capital is going to be my forever parts brand. Even if things slow down at some point or whatever the case, I I don't plan on going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. But uh definitely weird times. It's uh it's hard. Uh at the same time I, I do think starting the parts brand kind of goes hand in hand with the tour because I am actually able to go to all these BMX shops and 
you know, meet them and have my own experience with them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so some that leads to them becoming business partners and, you know, that that's all cool. Uh, I think that's all super BMX. Uh, I love that aspect of what I do. Um, but uh, there's definitely other forces at work. Uh, what's your pricing situation look like as far? Cause you, are you getting everything made U S so far? Uh, so I did have a batch of seats made in Taiwan. Yeah. I'd like to order. We just sold out of them actually. Um, for anybody listening, you can still check out some BMX shops that carry our stuff and find them. But uh, I'm out. <laughs> so, uh, so you got a fair a fair price on those then? How many did you have to buy? So I only bought a hundred for our first batch. That's not bad. Yeah, I bought a hundred, and I'd say I probably sponsored roughly twenty of them out to my team riders and some other dudes that I met on tour that I was just stoked on and wanted to support. So, so I probably the amount of seats I actually was able to sell probably like 80 seats you know um and that you know not not to talk too much in the numbers and shit but it probably worked out to about 20 dollars a seat you know yeah so that left me a little bit of a profit margin to work with bmx shops on them and they can still make a little bit of money off of the seats and you know i I was able to make a little bit of money off of the seats and uh Hopefully it uh, it all comes back around and there's a batch of new seats coming at some point. <laughs> yeah. Well, your your sprocket, I assume just look. I have a heavy manufacturing background, uh, mechanical engineer by by uh, degree and trade, and I know the level of detail in your sprockets, like. If you're buying 50 of those, you're paying $35, $40 a piece just for the main piece, not including the badges. Yeah, I would say it's probably a little bit more than that, uh, uh, including anodized. Yep, yep. and And then I don't pay myself for the time spent applying the badges onto the sprocket myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that is a timely process. Yeah. Unless somebody a bunch of clamps to me so i can do like 100 sprockets at once i'm thinking okay. that's because the apocalypse that too fast it, it's a timely process that uh, i don't account into the cost of them but uh, if i did uh, i probably wouldn't be making much money on them at all <laughs> well i figure all in your cost is probably upwards of 60 bucks not including labor yeah i'd say the sprockets are a little less than that uh but that's probably pretty on point with our stems mm-hmm. which uh those it, are just a nightmare cost it, it wise does, uh, i say it sucks but it doesn't suck because again this is something that i love about what i do very much and i take a lot of pride in being able to work with so many bmx shops which is if i'm not mistaken more than 20 shops now nationwide that are working with capital now so uh i'm very honored to be working with all those shops but when I sell a stem to a bike shop, I might make like 10 bucks off of that stem. Mm-hmm. If not less, like uh, I, I made way less than on pegs. <laughs> yeah. I made, I'm way sorry, le- I made way less on pegs. If I worked with a shop. Not it. <laughs> no, it, it was like, well, I've I've disclosed my numbers before. I don't really care. Uh, when we started Grindworks in 2013, our I was paying about nine dollars and fifty cents a piece per peg. Plus, yeah. then I had to make some toppers and get the packaging and all that stuff. I mean, all in probably ten, fifty, eleven bucks a piece. Um, right. Then. Like they those lasted. We were buying them like a hundred at a time. Those lasted a year, and then the next batch was like twelve fifty a piece because they way underbid it the first time and like hosed themselves. And I was selling them to shops for thirteen, oh, and man. selling them to the end users at twenty. 
right? And that would afford me to be able to give them away, too, at, to people. So, right. like, I'm not making a killing on those by any means. And then, like, 1250 was really, like, I, I can either just, like, literally pass these through and I'm just moving them for the sake of moving them to a shop, I can bump it to 14, or I can just not sell them to shops anymore. So we started doing 14, and I got some pushback because I'm cutting their margin to still sell them at 20. I'm like, yeah, I understand. Trust me. <laughs> um, then the next batch was like, Fourteen fifty a piece, mm -hmm. and they stayed. The next couple batches stayed pretty consistent at fourteen fifty a piece until twenty twenty. And I was running kind of low, like I had some left. And then twenty twenty, they went to twenty one fifty a piece to make. And Jeez. I'm like. I'm like, dude, I sell them for less than that. Like, this is a non-starter. And, yeah. and they're like, well, you know, we could look at changing some stuff. And, you know, we could look at getting tube and making a washer and welding it and then refinishing it. And I'm like, I don't like it. It's not going to be as good. Yeah. But, but where's the pricing at, right? And it's like, oh, nope, it's the same. It's still $20 to do it that way. I'm like, okay, well then why would we change? Uh pricing has come down slightly. I think the last quote I got was like nineteen dollars and fifty cents a piece. But I'm like unless the market shifts and pegs sell at thirty dollars a piece, there's no reason for me to restock them. Made in the US. Now Bruh. I pretty much at that time frame just you know, throttled back and coasted with, with my brand where I still have some inventory, not much, but like I get orders here and there and I'm like, cool. Like I'll ship that out, communicate with the person. I'm glad you're stoked, but I haven't promoted it. I dropped really supporting even a team because I don't have anything for you to promote and I don't know what my approach is. Then I moved from Pittsburgh back to New York and it just like put everything in storage to the point where I would get an order and I'd be like, oh, I have to go get those out of storage just to ship this. Cause I was living at my parents' house. Like yeah. now I'm finally in my own house again. And tear it back up. That's where I'm kind of at. I got to get some current quotes on, on what the cost is, but I, I've come to the point where, you know, the USA thing is awesome, and I prefer to do it that way. But really, selling pegs facilitates doing cool things for the scene. And I'd rather order them from Taiwan and be able to do cool things for the scene than be hung up on this high and mighty made in the USA only or get out kind of thing so like it will be full disclosure if we do that but that's kind of where I'm leaning with some of that stuff is like you know might be time to look at it and see where the pricing is if I can get them back to $9.50 a piece I would be stoked yeah that would be awesome uh, I've yet to look into making pegs myself it is on my to-do list but I'm I'm hoping and praying it's nowhere near the twenty dollars you just told me because that that's just not a viable option for a steel peg. Now, now a plastic peg, maybe because some companies are selling their plastic pegs for almost forty bucks for a peg. You know, so uh, maybe I wouldn't spend that much on a peg personally. Um, no, no, I, and that's the thing. I wouldn't either. Yeah, <laughs> like, like as soon as we hit twenty, I'm like, hmm. What is Grindworks? I don't know. Do I focus more on the podcast and try to grow the media side? Obviously the jams, but 
Like we we just posted a flyer last week with we put ten jams on it for this year. Nice. I I did see that. Uh, I'm hoping if we continue the tour that uh yeah we we'll, work our... we'll we'll blend them. That would be incredible, and, and hopefully I could be off for one of those weekends and in one of those areas. And God forbid, you know, people might not realize this about me, but I also like to ride bike jams, <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't happen very often. So, if I can make it to some jams that are not mine mm-hmm. out on the coast, I would be so excited. That would be incredible. Yeah, well, the the thing that's been interesting about this one is, like, it's kind of what you were doing, but I don't know if you saw in 2020, when everything was locked down, we did Insta Jams, and we just kind of came up with, like, a fun concept and let people run with it, and then reposted their stuff. I've Hell been, yeah. I've been asked a lot to rerun that. But Instagram made all their changes with reels and all this stuff. And just downloading other people's clips and reposting them is so much more complicated than it needs to be now. Uh, I I don't even deal with it. What you'd have to do is you'd have to get anybody that wants to be a part of the Insta Jam. You just need them to invite you as a collaborator Mm -hmm. on that so you can just click accept and it can be as easy as that maybe. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't write your own caption or nothing, but it'd be one way to do it. I'd love to see you do that again. That would be sick. It was so fun because it was like do a bar spin and I'd get a bunch of DMs that are like, well, I can't bar spin. And I'm like, no one said it had to be a bunny hop. <laughs> the bars need to rotate beyond that. Like I'm sharing whatever you come up with. So the, there was a, a couple people that had really awesome entries into everything, but you know, they want to see something like that again. I'm like, okay, well maybe what if we did it like little pop-up events? Right. And then I was like, why do they have to be little? We've got these pockets of friends and crews that want to be a part of this. So let's put it on one flyer and say hosted by, this crew hosted by this company and like it's still a grindworks jam i'll show up but it's your jam it's like your event if you want to grow it beyond my thing go ahead next year run it on your own some of them i feel a little odd about because we've been like the pittsburgh one i feel weird but it's my friend so i was like hey man I know we gave this to you. Like it's no, it was no longer the Grindworks jam after I moved away. It's been the Keystone jam ever since. And I was like, "Hey, I'm putting this thing together. Do you care if I put it on my flyer?" He's like, "No, nah, I don't care." So, it's the Grindworks Pittsburgh Street Jam hosted by Keystone on the flyer. Yeah. But then we're Heard trying to some... What? That's kind of similar to something I used to do with the tour, too, where, and I'm not going to lie, I haven't done this since probably, like, the second series of the tour, but, like, let's say, I'd say one good example would be Jib Crew in Atlanta. You know, they're the local dudes that host Street Jams, and he helped me get everything going to make a Street Jam happen in Atlanta. Um, So, on the flyer, it, it was still your stock capital, do the damn tour flyer with all that branding and jazz on it but you know underneath the do the damn tour logo it said in collaboration with and then the jib crew logo you know so um uh, i've been thinking to myself lately actually that uh it's something probably worth bringing back especially with uh some locals it it may help to make them feel like it's their thing yeah give it some ownership um But yeah, I mean, it's been pretty cool. We took that one, and then there's another jam that happens every year at uh, Rocky's Skate Park. And I know... The the bike shop? Yeah. Okay, damn. That's the one I should make it to then, because they're they're carrying capital products in their store. 
Yeah, Rocky's a super nice guy. He was he was super on board with what I was doing and everything. Yeah, that... he's he's awesome. Yeah, he uh he'd be stoked. He's he's always into whatever, but it's it's like one of those things where he's kind of looks forward to the jam happening every year, and then it falls on the shoulders of some of those locals, and they'll do it, but they don't really want to. Uh -huh. So it's like, hey, you know, I don't want to steal this if you want to run it. But otherwise, we'll just throw it on here and it can be hosted by you guys. And they're like, done. Good. That's so. sick. That's doing all that. Uh, I was really stoked when I seen y'all's schedule pop up. Uh, I think too many people don't appreciate, you know, the good that jams have to offer for these communities, you know regardless of who's the one making it happen you know a good jam is a good jam <laughs> well and just because it's on my flyer like it's not my jam it's your jam yeah it's their scene now, that's exactly how i feel about the tour too like i pull up to the city and it's not about me usually it's not even about my team you know my team riders make it to very few of the jams you know Usually it's just me holding a camera all day, filming just the locals, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's their jam. It's their prizes at the end of the jam. Like it, it's all for them. The only difference between me hosting a jam in a lot of these cities and a local hosting a jam in a lot of these cities is that I'm the one holding the camera throughout the day. You know, uh, uh, the turnout is still entirely dependent on the local scene. You know, it's, it's all up to them outside of me making a flyer and, filming a video of the day you know yep yeah uh, it's it's pretty awesome when you really look at it like that and I, th I think that might be what some people are missing that like you're not going to detroit to make detroit a capital city you want to go to detroit to help detroit kickstart having their own jams annually or whatever that's like and more or less it has their own jams it's one of those cities so I, i'm not trying to step on those toes either but like i just want to document their scene and put it on the youtube channel that has you know 52 scenes already documented on it you know and yeah it's it's kind of weird to me to think that anybody would want their scene to be excluded from that you know like but when you have towns as small as fargo north dakota Jackson, Mississippi, Charleston, South Carolina, you know, Hawaii, like when you got all these towns represented already, like how could you look at that and be like, man, like I don't want my scene represented in that, you know? It, that's weird to me. Yeah. <laughs> and again, I'm not trying to step on the toes of people that already host jams in any of the cities I go to. A lot of times those are the people I work with, you know, is the dudes that host the jams, you know, right. when they're work with me, you know, but yeah, it's, it's silly to want to keep your scene from being a part of something cool. <laughs> no more drama over it. No more. I'm over it too. You're right. Stupid. Um, you got anything else you want to talk about, Tim? We've been going a little over two hours now, so I mean, oh, we, Jesus. we really could just keep going into the weeds on, like, capital. We could go into the weeds on, like, any of this stuff. But I feel yeah. like you're also welcome back anytime you want to. We want to just take this off. Yeah. Um, I'd say if we want to end it on a positive note, uh, one thing I think we kind of trailed off from was the stems and sprockets. So uh, the stems and sprockets are the best stems and sprockets ever made. It's, I'm not making this up, but I heard it from somebody somewhere once, you know, so, uh, please do, if you're listening, check out our stuff. Even if you don't buy it, you know, let me know what you think. Give it a share. Maybe like I'm super stoked on our products that probably the biggest joy in my life right now. Um, and then aside from that, uh, for everybody that made it this far into the podcast, uh, I guess I'll share some good news, some very positive news and yeah you did send that... me what's that so you did send me a couple of things and i forgot to open them uh anyway oh. you trailed you trailed off for a second there so go 
Yeah. So, uh, one thing that I'm really stoked on in my life right now and something that is also beneficial to my team riders lives right now, hopefully, uh, is that uh, I was very lucky to work out a deal with Robbie at Colt, um, where Robbie is now essentially helping me sponsor my own team. And by that, I mean, you know, I, I got my dream team. Well, what I would consider to be my dream team, dudes that I've had my eye on for a long time, dudes that I've met through the tour and hung out with and have already worked on capital DVD parts with and whatnot. Um, bunch of badass riders, to say the least. And because of that, they tear through bike parts, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's been tough on me the past few months to actually support my riders the way that I want to because I only make stems and sprockets and seats you know so uh these dudes are blowing up wheels once a month and i'm like i I can't really afford to help you like like yeah i can i can sponsor you some used wheels here and there but it uh it doesn't help me keep operations afloat and you're just gonna blow them up anyways so (laughs) yeah it's been tough on me so uh Robbie was very nice in being willing to help me dial in my team riders bikes with cult parts. And in exchange for that, we are working on a mixtape with the capital team and uh, it's going to be a cult and capital collaboration mixtape. So uh, we've already got some pretty damn good filming done for it. And I'm really, really stoked with the way the project's uh, starting to work out Um, the whole project. uh, As long as I maintain uh, all creative responsibilities. The whole project is actually based around love and appreciating each other. And, uh, that's something that I think I've been lacking in my life lately. Uh, even maybe the past few years was genuine love. And, uh, uh, as much as I've always loved what I do and I, I've never not had love for what I do. Uh, I think I've been lacking love in other places in my life and, this whole project means a lot to me in that department to, to have love from Colt and to have the love of my team riders to come on board and help me see this vision through. Like that's, it's all fucking incredible. And I can't wait to share it with the world soon. We are hoping on wrapping it up and having something online, uh, hopefully towards the end of May this is the goal. Awesome. So that's, that's just one piece of really good news. Uh, it, well, again, and you, the drama, yeah. To, to touch on one thing you said in there about, like, lacking love, it's really easy to get caught up in the process. Because, like, you're in the process of filming er, and doing these trips and planning this and trying to keep the business running that it's easy to forget to slow down and breathe. No, oh, it is. And, and I struggle with that a lot. And, again, I think when it comes to my internet persona, like, I think it shows through sometimes how spread thin I am. And I think some people are going to misunderstand that no matter what, unfortunately, but I'm, I'm fully invested into what I do and it does take up all of my time. It takes up my whole life. It, you know, it it prevents a lot of good things in my life from happening and and not, not again, not complaining because I love what I do Mm -hmm. and it's worth the sacrifice I have to make. But I, I am guilty, guilty as charged for not taking a step back and breathe in and uh, understanding the good that has happened to me along the way. You know, I I do struggle with that a lot, and I, I admit that I'm open to it. And uh, again, that's going to be a big part of this project for me is working on being better about that, for sure. Uh, Being better about showing love, being better about accepting love, I think, is the way forward with uh, most problems in life, honestly. (laughs) Well, that would be a really awesome thing to wrap on, but I came up with another thing I want to bring up. (laughs) So, your bonus footage. Um, All right. How how is it being the X-Ride guy? with a blown up wrist that's pinned and fixed together and can't articulate. Uh, 
Oh God. Um. So <laughs> I learned X up rides because of my wrist. Um. One thing I cannot stress enough is when I was growing up into BMX, and I was, you know, back when I was like hungry for BMX, and I I thought I could pursue being a pro rider or something. Back then, I used to like see old video parts of like Edwin and all the animal bikes dudes doing fucking sick axe ride combos in the streets. And I, I remember literally a point in time where I would talk shit on it. And not because I thought it was stupid or ugly or anything, but it didn't make sense to me. I'm like, no, that's stupid. That's not real. Like, you know, it's CGI. Like, that's dumb, you know. Anyways, flash forward to 18-ish. Uh, I started breaking my scaphoid bone in my wrist a bunch. Uh, and, and anybody that knows about that, it's I think they deem it the BMX bone because it's it's real easy to catch yourself on your palm and break that bone. And it's just a little bitty bone in your wrist and it doesn't heal that good. And then it just keeps breaking and it's really annoying, you know? Um, anyways, after breaking it a handful of times, I had a surgeon put a screw in it. Um, long story short, very long story. And you can probably find that story on the internet. Anybody that wants to listen into detail, uh, but long story short, my wrist got infected and completely rotted away. And uh, a, a handful of my years there were spent living in absolute hell. My my hand was, because of all the damage to my wrist, my hand was like crippled. And I never had like strength in my hand. And like some days I couldn't move my fingers or open my hand fully. I can't now. But uh it was a nightmare. And after five surgeries on the fifth surgery, finally, my new surgeon uh, did give me a full wrist fusion, which means I don't have my dominant wrist anymore. It doesn't bend at all. Uh, what they scrape all the cartilage out from in between the bones, then they run a bunch of titanium bolts through everything. And then there's a plate right here on top of all of it. So I just have arm and hand. There's no, no wrist at all. Um, anyways, your, uh, question for you before you move on, does your, do your muscles still want to make that move and does it hurt if your muscles involuntarily do that? Um, so it's kind of a weird thing to think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to tell you right now, the other day I was out filming with Mike and, uh, uh, I film on a Panasonic HVX 200A. It's a big fucking dinosaur of a camera, you know. And, and we were filming something for a hot minute, you know. We we're putting some time in on a clip, and that's when I could feel those muscles in my like wrist trying to not be dormant, you know. And it's just because I was holding the camera in my hand the whole time. It was probably, you know, weighing on it at a weird angle or something. So, uh, that that's when I could kind of feel those muscles, but no, for the most part, it's not like something that I feel or think about. Um, uh, even getting used to the fused wrist, it's at least for me, it, it wasn't as weird as I think a lot of people would think. Part of that might be because I was a dumbass and rode my bike in a cast for a long time, and I would work in a cast, you know, dealing with the with the scaphoid breaks. Uh, but I was kind of already used to doing my everyday stuff with a disabled wrist and a cast, you know? So I think by the time I made it out, it didn't pay it any mind. Um, you know, I've been told that it's not something I noticed, but like when you got a fused wrist, you're doing a lot more with your shoulder and your elbow to compensate for it. Um, but yeah, the, the reason why losing my wrist made me learn X rides, which I thought was a trick that wasn't real and didn't work, um, was because throughout the whole process going in between all these different surgeries and like, like I'd have time in between surgeries where I was healed, but my hand didn't work, you know, cause it was so, you know, traumatized from all the surgeries and the infection and just everything that happened to it. But, uh, like, I'd have that healed time, and I would spend it riding, but, like, I couldn't bunny hop. You know, I pulled up on the handlebars, and my fingers would just let go. So, like, bunny hopping wasn't an option. 
and that's when I really, really dialed in rocket manuals. And that's when I learned X up rides out of the blue one day in between surgeries was because, you know, I, I couldn't really go to a skate park and flow around without, you know, risking eating shit. Cause my hand doesn't work. I can't bunny hop and do the street stuff that I want to be doing. Like, but I can go ride down a hill X up ride, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I remember it was scary when I first learned it. It was a crazy feeling, but like, because that was all I could do for so long, I got real comfortable with it. And then once I got the wrist fusion and I healed up from that and I regained the ability to like actually ride bikes, you know, now I can just throw X ups anywhere, you know, like, cause I'm, I spent so much time getting comfortable with it when I never really meant to. You know? <laughs> and, yeah. uh, it, it, it does kind of eat me up the X up ride stuff. Uh, uh, I, and I tell people this all the time, but I, I miss my old riding style. <laughs> and, and I would trade the X up rides for my old riding style any day of the week. Um, but I'm at a point now where like, like when I try to do my old style of tricks and I can still do them, it, it tends to be kind of a time consuming process, kind of getting stuff back. And, and a lot of it's like, spin stuff and tire tap stuff and like manual stuff you know so it's a lot of fighting for balance points and fighting to get the whole combo right and stuff and it's so easy for me to just say you know what fuck that part of the trick fuck that part of the trick and fuck that part of the trick we're just going to replace it all with x up rides and we're going to do it first try (laughs) so that's why my Instagram is primarily X up rides is because they're just easy for me. Now it's, it's easy for me to go out and film a fun new X up ride that makes me stoked and slap it on Instagram right quick. Uh, now that said, uh, when I get back to working on video parts of myself, I, I don't want to be Mr. X up ride in the video part world. Uh, I'd rather keep them, you know, few and far between the videos yeah. but uh May- maybe one just a nod to it or something but more than one but it, it'll have to be ones that i'm real proud of you know because i don't want six different x up ride 180s in a video you know i'd rather rather get some more manuals in there and bring back some of my old tricks and whatnot too you know but mm-hmm. uh as far as being an x ride guy on instagram i'll take it and uh yeah. If anybody wants to X ride down a twenty stair this week, uh I got a five dollar cash app on it, so <laughs> I'm all for it. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> uh what is it? you gotta go to the Lion twenty five and X ride down that now? <laughs> so uh if somebody flies me out there I'll do it. Uh I don't see why not. Um, the the steps look way better than the steps that El Toro has. <laughs> uh, that they do look way better. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, doing El Toro. Uh, I really only did it because mostly because it was a joke. Like I've joked about X up riding El Toro for probably as long as I could X up ride. You know, completely as a joke. And I've joked with a lot of people about it. And then, you know, I was out there in California, and I'm not going to lie, like, the scene's just different out there, you know? So I didn't have a lot of people actually trying to come ride with me and stuff. So one day I was like, fuck it, dude. I came out here to ride. Like, I didn't spend all this money coming to California, getting my wallet drained the whole time I'm in California. Everything's more expensive just mm-hmm. to not ride by. Like, dude, I, I'm going to go do a crazy X up ride on a famous spot, you know? And the first thing that came to mind was the Sears ledge, but I realized it was in Los Angeles after I had already went further south. I'm like, God. And I still want to do that one, but it just wasn't lining up to work. And then, uh, what, it, it was the same day I went to the Colt Warehouse for the first time. I, I went to the Colt Warehouse, and, like, that morning I realized how close I was to El Toro. And then I had, like, one of the St. Louis homies messaging me talking about, dude, just go X-Ride El Toro. And, and in the DMs, I'm like, you know, 
I like to joke about that, but I'm pretty sure if I go there, I'm going to bitch out. Like, but I don't know that I'm really going to do that, you know, but it kind of like planted the seed in my head and, and I'm, I'm at the warehouse talking to Robbie and I'm like, you know what, Robbie, I think I'm going to go X up right El Toro today. And I, I can only imagine what he thought of that. He probably thought I'm full of shit or something, you know, but uh, <laughs> sure as shit, we went out there, the homie Josh came with me to shoot it and uh i'm not gonna lie i did bitch out i i actually bitched out of doing it i firecrackered it a handful of times and the steps just were not good at all for it like it's a very violent firecracker going down it you know it's it doesn't have any smoothness to it and then yeah i'm still running up to it but like in my head i was i was done like i knew i wasn't doing it and it, I think it was like one of my last couple run-ups. Josh was like, Tim, you got to do it right now. The guy's coming to lock the gate. And I look over and sure shit, he's walking up the other stair set and he's walking over here. And I'm like, oh, yeah. and then I, was, I tried to turn off all my, my bad thoughts and I just dove into that shit X ride with the dude closing the gate behind me and didn't land it. Managed to get a second try before he got the gate fully closed. And that try almost died because there's like these metal like angle iron things on like the lip of each step going down. And, but it doesn't go across the whole step, you know. So on the second attempt, my tire on the hand, like the first handful of top steps made it behind the piece of metal. And it was like bump jumping my wheel and it like it it went into a rhythm of like it kept catching behind the metal plate and you know my wheel started jerking sideways and shit and i'm holding on backwards I'm like <laughs> oh my i'm about to flip over my bars fucking extra ride down a 20 stair uh luckily that didn't happen that was super scary I, words can't describe how scary the second attempt was uh and then you know he closed the gate after that and then I begged him, please let me give you $5 one more try. He wasn't having it. And uh, then we realized, you know, you can open that gate a little bit, you know, which left me just enough room to kind of take like a 90 car in. And I got it done third try. And uh, again, that I don't, I don't think I would do it again, you know, just because it didn't feel great. And the second try was really scary. I wouldn't want that to happen again. But the Leon 25, the steps look a little better. They definitely don't have the metal plates on them. And I don't see why not. Fuck it. It's pretty <laughs> much the same thing at that point. Probably. Maybe. I don't know. Somebody fly me out there. Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, the, the bump jump thing is terrifying, though, with that. Yeah, you see it in the video. Uh, it was better in the in the sequence photo Josh got of me in one of the sequences. You could actually see like where the piece of metal was sitting higher than my chair. Like, like it was behind it. It was so scary, and it it wasn't even a factor that like went through my head at all going into it. I you know, I probably firecrackered it like ten fifteen times too, and that didn't happen on any of the regular firecrackers or anything, but. Shoot, that second X up ride almost got me, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Man, how bad would that be? You get like bodied on a trick you didn't really care about. That was a joke for you, too. <laughs> yeah, so that would have sucked. And what really sucks with X up rides, and maybe this is just me, maybe I suck at bikes, maybe I suck at X up rides. But one thing I've noticed is there is no last second bailing out of X up rides. Like, one really good example, I've had, like, kids cut me off at a skate park, you know, like, snake me mid-X-Up, like, doing a fast X-Up ride across the skate park, and, like, like I, like you, you can't bail off the bike and get your hands out in time, you know, because you're all crossed up. Yeah, it's and, like and a, hunched in, too. Yeah, so if I would have had to have done that down a 20 stair, like, if I would have actually went OTB, lost my grip, whatever the case... Well, I would not have been able to get my hands out. I know that for a fact. I would have ragdolled my shoulder down that 20 stair. So, uh, you know, I, I get it. it. It was a bullshit trick, and it was a joke, and 
at the end of the day, it wasn't that hard to do, you know, the, the, there was a scary factor, but I'm not claiming that it was hard or anything, but, uh, it, it, was, it was pretty, pretty wild feeling to say the least. Yeah. But I, you gotta be careful to not sell yourself short on it too. Cause like, is it kind of a joke? Sure. But it's also something to be stoked on cause you got it done and it's scary yeah. either way. The uh, most recent clip on El Toro ever. <laughs> but uh yeah and, and i'm pretty sure and again i could be mistaken somebody please enlighten me but uh i don't think anybody's ever x up road a 20 stair at all uh i know i know people do x up firecrackers usually people stop at around 12 stairs you know uh at, at least in my experience clips i've seen and then ones i've done i've done plenty of eight to 12 stairs and like I can do those all week long. Uh, the, the 20 set felt really fucking scary going down. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a lot different, you know, but, uh, I am glad I got it done. I'm glad that dude came to, you know, shut down the spot. Yeah. It, uh, it made me actually try it. And that's the, only, that's honestly the only reason it happened. So, uh, shout out to all the gatekeepers out there helping me get shit done the way I want to get it done. Uh, I really love you guys. <laughs> That's got a, that spot in particular, like those people just have to hate that. Like how many times do they have to go lock those freaking gates because there's a skateboarder, a bike rider, a scooter dude out there. Yeah. Although I'm going to be honest. I don't think anybody's really been doing anything with it since I gated it off. Like, uh, uh, and at least from my perspective, when I was there, I don't see why people wouldn't still ride it like they were riding it 10 years ago. Like, there's still a lot of tricks that haven't been done on it. It wouldn't be that hard to uncap the rails. You know, uh, the gate is open part of the day. And there's mm -hmm. probably, I don't know, maybe for sure ways to open it. You know, I'm just saying people could still be riding that spot. Uh, there's a lot more to be done on it than freaking X up ride. <laughs> As you could X up ride into the approach for all of the tricks that have already been done on it. Oh my god. See that? <laughs> or... That's what the world is me to high speed X ride 180, but it... I'm sorry guys, it's not coming. What about low speed X up ride 180 into it and just fake you down the stairs? I have a team rider that I'd like to get out there one day because he'll fake you down those stairs. <laughs> I don't think I would want to do it. And I, I do fakies down small stair sets. I think they're a lot of fun. I don't care to find out with that one. I, I don't care to feel the difference between an eight stair and a 20 stair as far as a fakie goes. <laughs> it's how hard you fall on your back. Uh, I'd be worried about more than the back dude throwing a leg out there or something wrong, trying to jump off. Uh-uh. Oh, no, no. Could you imagine getting hung up behind the metal plate on a fakie? Uh-uh. Oh, Ca no. uh, catch a heel. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I want to see the Ellie slider down it, if anything. We're doing fakie stuff. <laughs> that, those little metal plates will just rip the tire off the bead. No, God, you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd say that's the only weird thing about the spot is the metal plates, but if you're not a pussy like me and you're actually going there to handle like some real shit, then uh, <laughs> they're not going to be in your way. <laughs> uh, now, the, there is three like poles sticking out of not the top of the rail, but like the uprights down here. And those are the grind stoppers. So I, I'm just saying it would be super easy to cut those three things off with a sawzall right quick. And then the rails are open game and they look nice. Well, and that, I mean, even if you're worried about <laughs> every time I talk, I think it mutes you, which is driving me crazy through this whole thing. I'm trying very carefully not to. Um, I feel like if you cut that off, even if it leaves like a hole or something, you can always just sleeve it, too. You can cut a piece of tube in half the long way and epoxy it onto the top to get your tricks done. Well, no, 
thing. The poles aren't welded to where you grind the rail. Like the interface that you grind on the rail is completely left alone. It's on the uprights, like halfway down the rail. It's like these L-shaped pieces that stick up. So it's like, like okay. if you just them um, off of the upright, like the rail is completely fine. Like it's three cuts with a sawzall for anybody that wants to hit that rail. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> <sighs> I don't want to hit the rail. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's just better to let it die for a little while and fizzle out and get, have less attention on it, and then you can go do that and people won't even notice. Right. I was, I was surprised the day I went there, like, I think we showed up, I think, 30 minutes after school got out, 30, 45 minutes after school got out. The gate to get into the school was open. You know, it was wide open, took us right to the bottom of the 20 stair, and then the yellow gates on top were wide open, you know, and I was there for at least half an hour, bitching out of it, genuinely, you know, before mm -hmm. that guy came. So there's at least an hour time span after school gets out where that shit's wide open, you know. I've heard other people say the only way to hit it is during school hours, but from my experience, an hour after school hours, that gate was wide open. and That dude wasn't in a rush to kick us out. He just wanted to lock the gate and do his job, you know? So, mm -hmm. didn't seem that busty to me. I say somebody go get after it. I say somebody jump down that bitch and land x right at the bottom, dude. Show me how it's done. I want, I want him to take off x ride, un-X up for the air, and then land x ride again. No, no, no. You got to You got to go the opposite way. Stay X ride in the air and then land X ride. I like the on X up. Oh, you like the on X up. Like... Well, you got to land X ride then. Yeah, yeah, you got to go back. Uh w one call out for the internet that I want to leave here on this is uh I'd really like to see an X ride backflip but without unwinding. Uh, you know, just stay in the X-ray, like, Wee! <laughs> and then land X-ride, you know? I think BMX deserves that, you know? One homie gave us the X-ride to unwind to backflip. That was sick. I'm just saying that I think we can do better in the world of X-ups. That's all. <laughs> all right. If you unwind, what if you go full click X the other way and then back for the land? Like, oh, God. I would... That's sick, right? Yeah, I just want to see new X ride combos. They fascinate me. <laughs> the dude that did the X ride flip, dude, fucking huge props to that guy because that shit was cracked, dude. That that was sick. That was super sick. I don't think I saw it. Man, I, I'll find the clip and I'll show it to you. I'll send it to you after this. But it was some jam. I, it was like COVID time. I want to say 2020, 2021. And it, it, I want to say it was a jam overseas at a skate park, and it was, like, in this big bowl, but they had made this huge, like, wooden ramp going out of the bowl, and homie fucking came in hot, fucking chirp, and then went off of this wood ramp, unwinded, backflip, dude. And I, I'm pretty sure it was NBD at the time. But I don't think anybody's done one since. <laughs> I can't imagine someone really wanting to. No, it's, I mean... Fuck, if I could flip, I'd give it a try. I don't want to learn flips, though. I'm not a transition rider. <laughs> yeah, I feel like once you learn them, then you just want to do them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I genuinely feel like, and again, this is somebody that can't flip, never tried flips, but I feel like it can't be much worse than a 360 as far as, like, body movement goes. You know, you're just... You're just spinning a 360 on a different axis, you know, but oh, the risk on that is so much more than than just bailing out of a three, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to get dumped on my head trying to learn some shit. And uh, I'm not one to ride a foam pit either. They seem to hurt me every time, so no flips for this guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. What do we got? Capital BMX brand, 
on Instagram, Capital BMX Brand on YouTube, Tim Hankins BMX on Instagram. Yes, sir. Uh, anything like that? Reach out for jams. Let Let's not let this die on the vine because of uh, yeah other people. Yeah, if anybody wants to help, again, I know Andrew dropped the whole list of states and cities that I'm trying to do jams in earlier in the podcast, but I genuinely have a few weeks to line up all of those jams if I'm going to do them. If not, the tour's probably over. You know, again, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. I'm not trying to work without locals. I'm trying to get the attention of the locals that will be willing to work with me, you know, so... Please don't hesitate to reach out any of those Instagram accounts or hit me up on Facebook. Fucking ask me for my phone number. If you want to talk on the phone about matters, just let's, uh, let's try to make good things happen. Please let's document the scenes and all 50 States so I can go home and quit bugging people, please. (laughs) (laughs) And if you're worried about it, sketched out, upset, uh, unsure, like just reach out because like, Talk to Tim yourself. If someone says something weird and it seems kind of outlandish, ask him. Yeah, good chance there's no truth to it. <laughs> People like to make things up, but I'm an open book. And if you got a question for me, a concern for me, please just treat me like you would treat any other human being and talk to me and let's figure it out seriously. Doesn't need to be any deeper than that. Yeah, no drama. Nice and easy. Uh, Tim, thank you. I know you're... Uh, I don't know how, how late you're up compared to your usual, but... No, That's about my bet. Chilling for a <laughs> while now, so... Sure. Uh, um, I'm going to wrap this up, and then we'll chat for another minute or so. All right, sounds good. All right. Thanks for uh, coming on. Thank you for having me, Andrew. Seriously, I appreciate you so much more than you know. Have a good night. Thanks for listening, everyone. Um, Next podcast, um, sometime. Episode 69.3. Yeah. (laughs) Come (laughs) soon.